just do that. Just give it one more minute and then I will introduce uh, our Havdalah program and then we'll move to some of our teachers. All right, uh, Alana, should I begin? Yes, please. Thank so, you. Erev Tov, everyone. It is Erev Tov, everyone. It's wonderful to be together and Shavua Tov. It's my pleasure to uh, welcome everyone to our Slichot Night Live uh, um, experience. And uh, I'm Rabbi Jacob Blumenthal. I'm the CEO of the Rabbinical Assembly and the United Synagogue for Conservative Judaism. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I'm speaking to you from outside Washington, DC in Gaithersburg, Maryland, but it's wonderful to welcome folks from all over North America and even beyond. Um, our, I'd like to first introduce Rabbi Cantor Luis Catan uh, to lead us in Havdalah. He's a uh, uh, Uruguayan board Chazan, Luis Catan, has a passion for Jewish music, Jewish culture, and Jewish spirituality, um, which infects every uh, part of his career. Ever since he arrived in the United States in 2003, he became, he became involved with the Cantor's Assembly and now serves as the president of the Cantor's Assembly. Um, he, uh, and the Cantor's Assembly, he says, uh, embodies and represents his passion for Jewish music, Jewish spirituality, and Jewish education. He serves at the Conservative Synagogue of Westport, Connecticut. He's been there since 2014. Welcome, uh, Cantor Luis Catan. Thank you so much, Jacob. Shavua Tov from Norwalk, actually. Betel in Norwalk, who is hosting uh, this year's Lichot together with Betel in Stanford. I'm joined here in a, an empty room yet because people have, hasn't arrived. I mean, people have, have, hasn't arrived yet. And, uh, and what we learned this, uh, this year and a half is that um, probably we can make our, our home wherever we are. And uh, this Yemei Tshuva, this uh, 10 days of ret return to ourselves is returning home. And home is literally where we are. So let's join for Abdullah. <laughs> Ladonai Yeshua, Adonai Everyone. <laughs> 
Thank you so much, uh, Hazan, Cantor, and Rabbi Luis Catan. Thank you to all of those who, uh, who uh, were part of uh, the musical ensemble and helped us uh, welcome a new week. Um, again, uh, welcome to everyone for our Slichot li Night Live um, evening. It was wonderful to welcome a new week with Havdalah. And now we'll be turning to some wonderful teachers to help us um, prepare for the holidays that are coming up. First, I just wanna thank the over 50 synagogues and organizations who serve as our co-sponsors for this evening. You can find those on our website. Um, I wanna thank Rabbi Alana Garber and Max Arad and other members of the Rabbinical Assembly staff who have put this evening together and are helping us with our technical uh, pieces this evening. And also a special welcome to the board of the United Synagogue, which is holding its board retreat virtually over the course of Shabbat and the weekend. It's wonderful to have many of you with us as well this evening. Our, our first guest this evening, our guest teacher is the Chancellor of the Jewish Theological Seminary, Dr. Shuli Rubin Schwartz, the Irving Lehman Research Professor of American Jewish History. He's a groundbreaking scholar of American Jewish history and visionary institutional leader. She's the eighth chancellor of the Jewish Theological Seminary and the first woman to assume the role. From 1993 to 2018, she served as the Dean of the Albert A. List College of Jewish Studies, JTS's undergraduate dual degree program with Columbia University and Barnard College. And in 2010, she was also named Dean of the Gershon Keck's Graduate School. And in 2018, she assumed the role of provost while continuing as Dean of the Keck's School. Among her publications is the award-winning book, The Rabbi's Wife, a trenchant examination of the role of rabbis' wives in the development of American Jewish life. I want to welcome Chancellor, Sh uh, Chancellor Schwartz. Uh, it's so wonderful to have you with us this evening. Thank you for uh, sharing your inspiring words. 
Thank you so much, Rabbi Blumenthal, and thank you, uh, everyone, all, uh, all the members of uh, your team who've made this possible, the congregations, and uh, wonderful to see so many faces this evening, uh, many uh, familiar to me, many new ones, and uh, wonderful to have the opportunity to and learn together with you um, this, uh, this evening. Uh, as we all uh, get in the mood and uh, prepare for the upcoming Yamim Noraim. So I'd like to focus today on, um, I guess, one of the ways in which we think about Rosh Hashanah, think about the Yamim Noraim, and think about it in terms of uh, Yom Hazikaron. The rabbis refer to uh, Rosh Hashanah is Yom Hazikaron, and remembrance, we know, is a central theme of Rosh Hashanah and the High Holidays in general. We also know that it's at the heart of the Musaf Amidah. The Zichronot anchors the three sections. We have Machuyot, then we have Zichronot, and then we have Shofarot. So I guess I've been thinking a lot about what is it that we're supposed to remember? Who should be doing that remembering uh, us individually? the Jewish people collectively, uh, God, and why are we so focused on remembering the past when, as we know, Rosh Hashanah ushers in a new year. We should be looking forward to the new year. And of course we are. So uh, I hope that you are all in, have in hand or accessible to you the texts that, um, we will be looking at uh, we'll be this putting that in in just a moment okay. uh, in the link. Great. Uh, and we're going to look at several texts that uh, that focus on this question of remembering. And hopefully that will give us a little uh, better sense of the way in which our tradition thinks about remembering, particularly at this time of year. So, um, is it in the chat now? Yes, it is. Okay. It great. is. There is that link right up there that was shared from me to everyone. You're welcome to, to take a look at that. I'll continue to share it. Great. Thank you, Rabbi Garber. Um, so, uh, you know, when we, we're going to, uh, a lot of these texts come from the Zichronot section of the uh, Amidah that we say both days of Rosh Hashanah. And the Zichonot section begins by noting that, of course, God remembers everything. And God knows everything from the beginning of creation. But then the text pivots quickly to recalling specific instances. So right now, when we are praying in the Amidah, we want to uh, help God focus God's attention on remembering certain things. We don't really want God to remember everything. We want God to remember certain things. And I guess by implication, we want to divert God's attention from remembering all of the ways in which we have fallen short this year and instead remember something else. So if you look at the first texts, the, the, uh, the first time that in the Zichonot section, the text gets specific is to talk about Noah. The first text tells us, the gam et Noah be'ahava zacharta. Did you not lovingly remember Noah when you brought the flood water, destroying all flesh because of their evil deeds? And then the text quotes from uh, Breshit from Genesis, from that parasha, and says, Vayizkor Elohim et Noach, et kol hachaya, et kol ha etc. God remembered Noach and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark, and God caused a wind to blow across the earth, and the waters subsided. So this first specific reference to remembering ties remembering to love. God remembers the creatures that God loves. 
And the second reference to remembering is in the middle of the flood, <laughs> the world was being destroyed. And thankfully, God diverted God's attention away from the destruction to remember, oh, right, yes, I, I did save humanity in the Teva, in the ark, and now I have to end the flood so that Noah and all of the creatures on the ark with Noah and his family can now, um, uh, you know, resume life on earth, right? So that the rains will end, so that they'll be able to exit the, the Teva. And both of these here connect memory then with love. God remembers, and when God remembers, that leads God to act with, as we will see, with chesed, right? So you have a connection between remembering love and loving kindness. You see this in another quote in the same section of the Zichronot, this one from the book of Psalms. This is the, the second text um, on, this, uh, on this sheet. And that is uh, again from, uh, from the book of Psalms, Psalms 106, where it says, Vayizkor lahem brito vayinachem kirov chasado. God remembered God's covenant and with great love, relented. In a simplified way of thinking about this, ahava, love, is an emotional orientation. Chesed, loving kindness, relates to action. Chesed forges and builds human connection, and ahava, love, is the impetus for that human connection. This is so beautifully captured in the next image from the Zichonot section, probably my favorite portion of the High Holiday Liturgy. This comes from Jeremiah. It captures this, uh, this love with a remarkable imagery by uh, describing Israel as God's bride. Haloch v'karata v'ozne Yerushalayim lemor ko amar Adonai zacharti lach chesed ni'urayich ahavat klulo tayich lechtech acharei b'midbar be'eret lo zeru'a. Go proclaim to Jerusalem, thus said the Lord, I accounted to your favor the devotion of the, the loving kindness of your youth, chesed, your love, Ahava, as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness in a land not sown. Here I included the, the English here of the Rashi on this, um, on this section, Rashi from the uh, 11th century, uh, where Rashi says, what does it mean to remember, right? Would you return to me, God is saying to the B'nai Israel, I would desire to have mercy on you, for I remember the loving kindness of your youth and the love of the nuptials of your wedding canopy when I brought you into the wedding canopy. And this, Klulotayich, is an expression of bringing in, of bringing close someone that you love. And what is your nuptials mean? What is it? What is this loving kindness of your youth? What is it that God is remembering? God is remembering the loyalty of B'nai Israel following Moses and Aaron from an inhabitant land, right? Leaving Egypt with Moses and Aaron, not knowing what lay before them without any provisions, since you, you, B'nai Israel, believed in me, God, right? Again, you see here these, the uh, selective uh, retelling of the story, right? What is it in this section 
What is it that Jeremiah wants God to remember? B'nai Israel's loyalty. We know that the <laughs> that the Torah is filled with all of the complaining that B'nai Israel did as soon as they got in the desert. How they said, "Oh, why did you take us out of here? We have no, we don't have food. We would have been better off in Egypt." That is not what we want God to remember right now, and so we are very clearly focused, focused on the intimacy and here by using the marital imagery, it is um, really reinforcing this sense of the loving relationship that B'nai Israel are in with God and marriage then becomes a very compelling metaphor for the love between God and humanity. We know, of course, that marriage is not about blind love or blind faith. It's about informed, trusting love. It is about cherishing the strengths of those we love, forgiving their flaws, being patient with them. And it's about uh, a relationship in which we demonstrate our love through acts of chesed, both large and small that is what um, sustains and grows a loving, intimate um, relationship in marriage. So the kind of the next step beyond this is the connection between remembering love and chesed that extends then to compassion. So let's look at the, uh, at the fourth text we're gonna we're, you see we're running through these quickly and then we'll have time um, for questions and to focus on this a little more when we get to the end of um uh of the text from the zikrona section so this next one uh again in this same section also from jeremiah again is talking again about remembering but it is, it is making yet another connection. Haven yakir li Ephraim im yeled sha'ashu'im ki midei dabri bo zachor eskirenu od. Al kein hamu me'ai lo rachem arachamenu ne'um Adonai. Is not Ephraim my dear son, my precious child, whom I remember fondly, even when I speak against him? So my heart reaches out to him and I always feel compassion for him, declares Adonai. Okay, it adds that element of compassion, Rachmanut, Rachem Arachmenu. And interestingly, these same themes we see in the Haftarah of the second day of, um, of Rosh Hashanah, which is also from Jeremiah, uh, which includes the following quote, the next, uh, the next quote that you have on the, uh, number five. May rachok Adonai nir ali v'havat olam ahavtich al kein mishachtich chasad. The Lord revealed God's self to me of old, eternal love I conceived for you then. Therefore, I continue my grace to you. In other words, God's eternal love, Ahavat Olam, lays the foundation for God's acts of chesed, the acts of loving kindness towards humanity. So all of this, to me, sounds beautiful. It sounds lovely. Yes, that is exactly what I want God to remember, that God loves us, that God will act kindly towards us, act generously towards us, act mercifully towards us. When we are beginning there, the 10 days of repentance, the, the yamim no ra'im, when God is judging our actions and we all know 
during this period of introspection, the ways in which we've fallen short, that is exactly what we want God to remember. So I don't know about you, but I've always been puzzled by the fact that the Zichonot then ends with reminding us of the Akedah. This closing section of the Zichonot paragraph is also, as uh, many of you know, it's also cited in the early part of the morning daily liturgy. Um, and and in, a, in traditional Sidurim, the morning liturgy has the whole uh, Akedah, Genesis 22, in it, and has this paragraph before that um, then inclusion so that one can recite the Akedah. So we are asking God in this section to remember us favorably, right? So why are we asking God to remember the Akedah? And that's what I would like us to focus on and think about together. To me, um, it's hardly a moment that reflects the love we want to remind God to show us. So let's, let's look together at this section. And I would love to know your thoughts. Um, I have some as well. Uzuhor lanu Adonai Eloheinu etabrit ve'et hachesed ve'et hashvua asher nishpat al Avraham Avinu behar hamoria. For our sake, remember your loving relationship with us, the covenant and the promise you made to Abraham on Mount Moriah. Betera elefanecha akedash akad Avraham Avinu et Yitzchak beno al gabe hamizbeach v'chavash Rachamav la asot utsoncha belevav shalem. Kain yichbeshu rachamecha et kaascha mealenu. Hold before you the image of our ancestor Abraham binding his son Isaac on the altar when he overcame his compassion in order to obey your command wholeheartedly. Now allow your compassion to overcome your anger at us. So, okay, what's going on here? To me, it seems strange. Strange on several different levels, because first of all, if we remember the beginning of the Akedah story, it says very explicitly that God is asking Abraham to take his son, right? His only son, Asher Ahavta. So that loving imagery is an imagery about Abraham and his son. And yet God is asking, Abraham to sacrifice his son. So it seems very odd to me that we would be recalling this image here. To me, it's a, it, it sort of seems to be uh, achieving the opposite of what we were looking for. Then if we look carefully at the end of this, right? What does it say? The, Abraham overcame his compassion, his compassion, Rahamav, compassion, as we know, we've just seen the connection between love and loving kindness and compassion. So here it's Abraham who has compassion and Abraham has to suppress his compassion in order to obey God's command. So in a sense, what this is asking is it is asking God to emulate Abraham, but in the opposite manner. We are asking now God to have God's compassion overcome God's anger. So in 
I guess the question I am asking is, what exactly are we asking God to remember? When we are, when the liturgy invokes the Akedah, is the liturgy asking God to emulate Abraham who put faith over Rachamim or to channel Rachamim over judgment? What is it that we are asking of God in this particular section here? And I'm gonna pause. I know there are many people here, but I'd be love to maybe I think we have some uh, hands raised and I did do the thing where I think I have to help people unmute. So Good. if you raise your hand um, using the function on the bottom um, or put it in the chat and uh, Rabbi Blumenthal here, I'll unmute you as well. Um, uh, but I do see Ed Bolson has his hand raised. Let's see. Ask to unmute. Ed, are you there? Okay, I'm going to go on to David Sherman. Oh, I see lots of hands. I David Sherman, go for it. Myself here. Um, are we not asking um, God to treat us in a midah, a midah um, way, a characteristic for a characteristic, as Abraham? Uh, su suppressed his other emotions. Uh, are, are we not asking God to kibiachol suppress God's? Great. Uh, let, let's take a few comments and then I'll respond. Uh, Pam Geyer. Yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it. A, it's a deeper mystery because Kavash Rahamav is used here in two different meanings. In one way, Kavash Rahamav is suppress his compassion, and the other one is, is use the compassion to overcome the anger. So the same phrase, Kavash Rahamav, is using completely two different meanings. So your mystery is much deeper than you presented it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there other comments? I don't see other official hands raised. <laughs> okay. So one of the ways for us to uh, think about this because is, um, let's look at the last uh, text that I have here. And, and that will get at some of the, uh, the mystery of this, at least for me, it helped provide me with a response. This is, a, uh, as you see, a section from uh, Brachot, from the, from the Talmud. And um, well, let's just read it together. Uh, and because it uses, uh, it uses this phrase itself. Okay, uh, I'm going to read this in English now. Similarly, it was taught in a Brita that Rabbi Yishmael ben Elisha, the high priest, said, Once on Yom Kippur, I entered the innermost sanctum, the Holy of Holies, to offer incense. And in a vision, I saw a Katriel Yah, the Lord of hosts. That's one of the names of God uh, that expresses God's ultimate authority. Uh, so a Katrielia was seated upon a high and exalted throne, and a Katrielia said to me, Yishmael, my son, bless me. So I said to a Katrielia the prayer that God prays. May it be your will that your mercy overcome your anger. Yihi ratzon milfanecha sheyichbishu rachamecha et kaascha. And may your mercy prevail over your other attributes. Rachamecha, 
Migolu Rahamecha Almidotecha. And may you act toward your children with the attribute of mercy. And may you enter before them beyond the letter of the law. The Holy One, blessed be He, God nodded God's head and accepted the blessing. Okay, so there's a there's an you know here they they give the, their their takeaway from this, which teaches us you should not take the blessing of an ordinary person lightly, because if God asked for and accepted a person's blessing, all the more so that a person must value the blessing of another person. So. This same phrase that we saw in the text above, Yifbeshu Rachamecha et Chaschame Aleinu, taken in this context of this um, text from Brachot, re reminds us here. It's just such a such a different image. We generally speak think of us as, um, you know. Uh, striving for imitatio dei, right? We should be godlike, having been created the Tzelam Elohim. But here in this pra this prayer insists and and kind of then maybe gives us this window into the interpretation of the Akedah and in insists here that God be or or prays and hopes that God will be more human like that God, like a loving parent, should remember the good and overlook or even forget some of the bad. We want God not to be driven by anger and not to forget, but also not to remember everything. <laughs> we want God to remember God's love for us a love that will lead God to deal kindly and mercifully with us. So I guess I make sense of the Akedah here in this Zichronot section by, in a way, seeing it as a test for Avraham Avinu, but for all of us to trust that ultimately God's love for humanity will prevail over God's other qualities and lead to acts of loving kindness. We know we will always fall short of what God wants. It's only by loving God and trusting God that uh, we can expect God to love us uh, despite our flaws, that God can have faith in us despite our shortcomings, that we can engage in tshuva. I think we do so because we want to believe that we can be more godlike. And in a way, I think when we are reminding God to set aside God, to, to have God's compassion overcome God's anger, we want to try to do the same. We want our love and loving kindness and empathy and generosity to overcome the other emotions that we have and that we cop all hate for on Yom Kippur, jealousy, hatred, anger. We strive to live up to God's best qualities by trying to forefront them in our own lives. And um, I guess that gives us the confidence to do our part, uh, not only to try to be our best selves, but to kind of act on our best selves um, to make the world a better place, I guess. So um, that's the way I see it. I would love to, um, again, pause and, uh, and hear from I think, uh, any of I you. I think we'll need, people might want to put their uh, thoughts in the chat because we are going to need to turn to our next uh, teacher in a moment. Um, but we'd love for folks to take a minute and just what, what you and what your reflections are 
on the chancellor's teaching and put them in the chat for us to share with one another would be wonderful. And uh, Chancellor Schwartz, do you have any, do you, any do you wanna wrap up with any final words? Absolutely. Look, I guess I would just uh, end with the prayer for all of us that if we remember this on Rosh Hashanah, I pray that we will um, succeed in imitating this aspect of God that we're focusing on. Uh, remembering, remembering love, remembering um, uh, the best qualities in those that we love, focusing on the fact that feeling that love should lead us to acts of loving kindness and to mercy. And my prayer is that be this behavior on our part will bring God and humans closer and the world closer to perfection. Vinomar Amen. Thank you, uh, Chancellor Shuli Rubin Schwartz, for your wonderful words, inspiring us as we move into these holidays. Um, I think for me, the image I take is um, my role in setting an example for God. Um, that if our love can overcome any anger or even our, our sense of strict justice, that perhaps that's what we're trying to set an example for God, and perhaps we can actually provide that inspiration for God as we're moving as God then reviews our lives in the course of the holiday. So I just thank you. It's a beautiful image, and I have to say, um, a great challenge. So um, um, let love and chesed and rachamim, compassion and loving kindness fill our lives with each other and hopefully towards God as well. Thank you so much for a beautiful teaching and uh, wishes to you and to all at the Jewish Theological Seminary for a Shana Tova Umetuka. And I'm pleased now to introduce our next uh, guest teacher, uh, Rabbi Ben Herman who serves at Beit Shira in Miami, Florida. She, he's married to Karina and is the father of Ariella and Leora. His programming at the synagogue is often described as innovative and dynamic. Uh, his congregation won a Solomon Schechter Award from the United Synagogue for his hiking and halacha program. Uh, he has instituted a drive-through sukkah at Beit Shira and also drive, a drive-in Shabbat last summer. Um, and uh, he has seen the COVID pandemic as an opportunity to learn how to live with the unknown and uncertainty. And those that will um, be the theme of his reflections and teaching this evening. Rabbi Herman, welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Rabbi Blumenthal. And wow, to follow uh, uh, Dr. Shuli Rubin Schwartz, uh, I never would have Imagine what a beautiful, inspiring teaching to uh, set as a keynote, as well as a beautiful Havdalah by Cantor Luis Catan. I'm just going to start by saying my thoughts and prayers are with those in Louisiana and the greater New Orleans region as Hurricane Ida bears down on them, as well as those impacted by fires, um, those around Lake Tahoe and other parts of Northern California. Um, I'm going to start with a nigun, and if there's time, we'll play another version of it at the end. This is from one of the people I consider my teachers, uh, Rabbi Shefa Gold. And it comes from after Pharaoh says, okay, Moses, you can go forward, just get out of here in Parshat Bo. And uh, I need to know exactly where you're going, how many you're taking with you. And Moses says to Pharaoh, no, you need to provide the sacrifices. And we don't know what we are going to do to worship God until we arrive in that place. So here is the nigun. One sec. I shared sound, so it should come through. Lone da man avul etia at boeinu shema. Lone da man avul etia at boeinu shema. Lone da. Man, I 
we're supposed to do until we get to that moment in time. I'm a recovering black and white thinker and COVID definitely has helped uh, with that. I wish it didn't have to happen, over 600,000 dead, so many more who have been gravely sick. But if that does not show what that, uh, we cannot take anything for granted. We don't know what the next day will bring. I don't know what will show that. It reminds me of a time in rabbinical school when I was working with my chavruta, Rabbi Michelle Dardashti, and we were doing a presentation on different readings of Hagar and Ishmael's banishment, that Torah reading we read the first day of Rosh Hashanah. And I saw things a certain way. And finally, Rabbi Dardashti said to me, Ben, you don't know how to handle ambiguity. And learning how to see things not in black and white, but in shades of gray has become really an interest of mine not just during this pandemic, but as a lesson for life, learning that everything is impermanent and that we better become comfortable with uncertainty and the unknown. And our tradition has a lot to say about it. So first there's a danger of not knowing. And for this, I could have taken Exodus 32, verse 1. Instead, I chose verse 23, very similar. But this is Aaron's response to Moses. And he's talking about how the people are bent on evil. They said to me, Make for us a God, who will go before us. He zeh Moshe Ha'ish for that man Moses, Asher Ha'elanu Me'eretz Bisraim, who led us out of the land of Egypt. Lo yadanu, we do not know Mehayalo what happened to him. So not knowing, I know we say ignorance is bliss, but sometimes not knowing can lead to one acting of their own devices. And in this case, it was a mob of angry people creating one of the cardinal sins, idolatry. So that's a danger of not knowing, but of course there's danger in knowing and we just, we need to turn no further than Gan Eden, the garden of Eden after eating from the fruits, from Adam and Eve, but tipakachna nehem, their eyes were both opened. They knew they were naked. They made, they sowed fig leaves. They made for themselves belts. And one could very easily argue that thinking we knew the difference between Tov and Ra is what got us kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Sometimes it's better not to ask certain questions. The rabbis go on with this in Talmud Chagiga in the second chapter, if you're interested. 
And uh, so both ways, whether sometimes it's better to know things because not knowing could lead to us acting rashly or irrationally or unwisely. And at other times in life, it's better not to know. Ignorance truly is bliss. So these are just a couple biblical texts, but the rabbis have some interesting things to say that I want to share. Irke Avot, the well-known Mishnah Ethics of the Fathers, says, Shiva dvarim bagolam v'shiva bechacham. There are seven things, seven characteristics that differentiate a golem, literally a clod, a lifeless form of matter from a person. And I just added the fifth. Alma shelo shama omer lo shamati. When a person doesn't know, he or she says, I don't know. They don't try to come up with an answer on the spot and press people. They don't try to dodge a question. They simply say, lo shamati, I have never heard this. Again, this is from a time when there was oral traditions. So if it's something they never heard, they admit to not having heard it. Talmud Brachot, toward the beginning of the study of Talmud, the Amar Mar, the master said, and we're not 100% sure, at least from the Talmudic text itself, who this Mar is, but he said, La made Lashoncha, Train your tongue, Lomar, to say, Eni Odea, I do not know. Shema titbade bate achez, lest you become entangled in a web of deceit. And we know how easy it can be to want to know something and to just make that first little white lie type of thing. And sometimes we need the white lie but we make that first little misstep and it leads to another and it leads to another. Um, I'll give you a personal example and then we'll continue. I um, used to have an inferiority complex with the Orthodox and I went to the Stiebel on 84th Street when I was in rabbinical school and I was asked, what do you do? And I should have said, I'm a rabbinical student at JTS. That was the honest answer. But I said, I'm a student. And they said, oh, where are you a student? So I said, I didn't even say JTS. I said, and I'm embarrassed to admit this, at Chata'ayan I said, Columbia. They said, oh, what do you study? Well, I was a history major in undergrad. Um, so I said, history. Are you with Stanislavski or this one? It goes on and on. So be very careful. And that was not an I don't know example. That's not a fair example here. But that's showing how it's easy to become entangled in a web of deceit. We're going to go back to the not knowing connected to the pandemic. Don't worry. But right now, I'm dealing with not knowing in general. I learned from my Chavruta, Rabbi Mitshefetz, that we often think that the Chacham is the smartest of the four children. That's, that's the highest level. After all, it's Chacham. It's a wise one. But in the Kabbalistic levels, and again, four children corresponding to four worlds, the Chacham is actually Asiyah, the world of action, the lowest level of spiritual growth. Dealing with particular details, the Eidot, Chukim uh, Mishpatim, but not the big picture. And in Kabbalah, the four children represent a progression from highest to lowest, with the highest level being the one so taken in by the profound nature of our world that she or he does not even know how to ask a question. It's like those moments where all you can say is, wow, you can't rationalize them. You can't prove them through uh, empiricism. You just don't even know what to ask, but you know it's something profound. It's fairly well known that Rashi often will say in Iodea, he will say, I don't know in his comments. And what does that mean? He could have just said nothing at all. 
very easy. Rashi, there are verses which Rashi doesn't comment on. Yes, he's a commentator par excellence, as uh, Dr. Schwartz said, 11th century French commentator. But saying, I don't know, is actually instructive. It points to humility, to acceptance on our limits of knowing, to the limitlessness of God's knowing, and offers a charge to the next generation to study up and discover. And for even our greatest commentator, Rashi, to say, I don't know, that speaks volumes to me. He was comfortable with not having all the answers. Maybe even comfortable with ambiguity. That's another step. But at least being able to say when he doesn't know, when he's uncertain of something. Here are some non-Jewish sources. There's a powerful Zen koan, which I'm going to begin my second day of Rosh Hashanah sermon with. So my congregants, I won't give any more of it away. But I use this to meditate often. You say, where are you going? I don't know. And the Buddhist scholar, Jadu Krishmamurti, said, practice responding, I don't know, anytime someone asks you a question. And why? Certainly, we know the answer to things. But if we practice that, then on those occasions when we really don't know, when we're really uncertain, when it's messy or murky, maybe we will respond, I don't know. So we need to practice it. It's innate to want to have answers, to want to have certainty. I'll come back to that in a minute. And I'll tie it to the first text on the golden calf in a minute. Okay. A Buddhist teaching is not knowing is most in, intimate. And yes, this doesn't fit with the others, Zen and Buddhism. But I put it in here from Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, the sixth book in the series. It is the unknown we fear when we look upon death and darkness, nothing more. I'm also in my high holiday preparations giving a Yisker sermon on encountering death. And often what we fear is we don't know what will happen. No one's come back to tell us. And so being able to live without having all the answers, being able to handle the murkiness and the messiness of life. And with COVID, Many of us thought we were in the clear after the vaccinations. I mean, I didn't because I've got two girls who are not vaccinated who are under 12, but uh, many, many of us did. And then the Delta variant comes. So this roller coaster has uh, led to a lot of frustration for many of us and uh, anxiety about what the future holds and will we ever get out of this. One of my favorite books I read this year was I believe it's Estelle Frankel. Um, and if it is, I apologize. Um, but the book's title is The Wisdom of Not Knowing. And just a few pages from that book. Once we step into the unknown, we discover that life is uncertain. There's no fixed script to follow. It's like I think when I took ballroom dance in college. And I was so focused on getting the steps right that my dancing was horrible. Because if you focus too much on slow, slow, quick, quick, and foxtrot, then you're not natural. You're not authentic to the moment. The biblical metaphor for clinging to certainty, fixating on the past, and trying to control everything is idolatry. We think of idolatry as setting up a statue, but it's not. It certainty, one of the symbols of certainty is idolatry. We know that we can't hold on to all that we know, that life will throw us in zigzags, that life will take us in different directions. And also I would add to this, Pharaoh is another symbol, the hardened heart, the one way of doing things, my way or the highway. That's problematic thinking to say the least. And Ms. Frankel writes, before we can set ourselves free, we much, must confront our human impulse to seek security by clinging to the known and certain. 
It would take 40 years in the desert facing the unknown day after day. Remember, one of the first people our ancestors hit was Amalek, who attacked them from the rear. That was a classic example of the unknown we just read about in the moth here this last week. And it would take wandering day after day, not knowing where their next source of drink would come. Yes, food mana, but not knowing where the wadi was or the well, especially after Miriam's death. And it would take these 40 years in order for the Israelites to learn to trust an invisible God whose essence is unknown and ever-changing. My Chavruta Rabbi Shefetz also says that anxiety is the opposite of faith. When we say amen, um, it's not I agree, it's I have emunah, I have faith in the future. And that's what Judaism is all about, having faith in our future, even when things don't seem so rosy. Okay, I'm going to see if there are any questions. I'm going to take off the screen share, and then uh, we will do another version of uh, Rabbi Shefa Gold's chants. And we can invite folks to put some questions in the chat if you'd like. Um, Thank you, Edie. You you see, I... to... Oh, go ahead. Estelle go ahead. Franco, yes. Yes. And, uh, and, or if somebody wants to raise their hand and, and for a comment or a question, maybe how this teaching uh, relates to your experiences over the past uh, 18 months, we'd welcome that. I see Lou, if you want to, I, I can, uh, let me, I can unmute you. Hey, my name's Lou Klein. I'm from Austin, Texas. And I just wanted to say that um, I think the best thing my rabbi ever said to me when I went um, for pastoral kind of reasons was, I don't know. Um, because there's so many things we just can't explain, tragedies especially. And I think that the most, it was the most comforting thing that I heard. Um, and uh, I appreciate your addressing the, I don't know. Thank you. Um, it's something that I felt was uh, important enough to uh, result this, uh, to um, devote a sermon to on Rosh Hashanah, not a COVID sermon. I think people are uh, at a point where uh, please, not another COVID sermon, but a sermon about dealing with the unknown in life and figuring things out. And uh, my former neighbor, Rabbi Yafi, wrote, and he's correct, Hanista wrote, Lashem Alokeno. Those things which are secret, we leave to God. And But those things which are revealed, and then it has dots above it, that's our responsibility to deal with. We can only control what we know about, and we can grow in our knowledge over time. And uh, the, um, Aviva, I really like that as well. We were in the desert for 40 years. Now we want answers. We had the quickest development of a vaccine ever, and we want to, uh, and yes, I'm not going to get into COVID and uh, the the, 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 the issues therein, but uh, we want everything to be solved and swept under the rug. And I have another part of one of my sermons are, uh, where I'm talking about return to normalcy. Can we really return to February, 2020? Do we really want to do that? Is that the goal? The goal is to adapt to whatever comes our way, not to be naive about it, not to throw up our hands in the air about things like climate change, no. But when we need to, to be able to adapt, that's what the rabbis did after the destruction of the second temple. And that's what we need to do as well. So the title of the book is The Wisdom of Not Knowing by Estelle Frankel. I'm going to play, if, uh, Unless someone else has a question, I'll play the Nigun one more time, and I'm going to play a harmony of it. And before I play it, I'll just um, mention there's another part of the text. Um, so I'm going to do two, two separate screen shares, this one just for 
Rabbi Shefa's comments. We don't know what form our service will take, what the world will be like, or what will be called from us. The world is in flux and our lives are also changing moment to moment. We just don't know. Not knowing can be terrifying and yet it also holds the infinite potential of our power and creativity. We can only prepare for this mystery by becoming fully present, by accessing the fullness of being in this moment, knowing when we are called, we will respond with that fullness. On this journey to freedom, we must dare to live in a place of uncertainty that's held inside the confidence that just showing up in our fullness and in our uniqueness is enough. We won't know what is needed until we get there. Each moment is a new there, as is each breath. And um, I'll share one more story and then share this uh, by um, uh, the Nigun, and I'll share um, a different version of it. When I was working as a rabbinical student with a fellowship, with a Jew, an internship with the Jewish Council on Urban Affairs in Chicago, I was placed with the Inner City Muslim Action Network. And I've often been an outcome-oriented person rather than a process-oriented person. Had to work on patience a lot in life. Um, it's either patience or suffering, same root in Hebrew. And so I talked to my supervisor, why is there not more happening? Why can't I do more? And he said to me, Ben, well, wasn't a rabbi at the time, Ben, you're just being here makes a difference. As a Jew working with Muslims, helping African-Americans on criminal justice reform, your being here makes a difference. And it reminds me we are human beings, not human doings. You hear the sound?
Thank you, everyone. Let me just make sure, see if there were more questions. I, I, oh, good. I can Thank invite you. Uh, Ruth Ellen Mulberg is, uh, has asked to uh, uh, make a comment or a question. So we'll turn to them. Thank you so much. Unless you have questions first. I'm sorry, I can't peck out fast enough. Uh, thank you for what you said, Rabbi. And what you said made me talking about not being able to accept uh, uncertainty made me think of something else I've been studying that others may be familiar with through the Musar tradition of Musar and the Midot that we try to uh, balance these characteristics so that we're more holy like God. And, and the foundational one is humility. And it plays into that. It takes a certain humility in order to accept that one doesn't know something. So in that way, you're giving way to surrendering to to Hashem and also to the respecting other people's, uh, you know, needs and interpretations for what's going on. And so then that also helped me tie in exactly to what the chancellor was talking about as well to try to fold it all together. The idea of, you know, is God trying to be more like us or are we trying to act more like him? And I think it's, it's a conversation. So it may well be both. But one of the ways to do that is to be humble and accept what, what one doesn't know. And then lastly, that whole fear, that's the, the hubris and everything that comes from people not accepting the COVID and all that is, I think, not only fear like Harry Potter said, but fear of the loss of control over our own destiny. So... Um, Thank you for helping me put all that together and I hope maybe that made some sense to some of the others listening. It's definitely tied into the Musar tradition and I'll end on this note. Uh, and I said, I just sent my sheet to uh, Rabbi Lana Garber so she will post this uh, here. Um, it's Anava in the Musar tradition and this was new to me. It's not a end point, it's a middle point. It's the middle between shval, ruach, self-effacement, and ga'ava, which is excess pride or hubris. And so when Moses is, is anav, and we need to have humility in life, that doesn't mean that we need to um, be doormats. Actually, Alan Morena says it the best. No more than my place, no less than my space. And the part that you're talking about is recognizing we don't have all the answers and going with the best knowledge we have with COVID with our physicians. I have an infectious disease specialist, the head of my uh, physicians committee. I'm sure others of you do at your synagogues as well or other physicians who are seeing this on a daily basis. You go by the experts and you make the best decisions you can with the facts you have at the time. And if you made a not bad decision, uh, let, let me just say, there's no wrong decision, but uh, they, they're better and worse decisions. You don't beat yourself up over it. You say, this was the best I had with what I had at the time. And uh, I didn't have all the answers. I didn't have a crystal ball and you move on as best as you can. So I appreciate your sharing from the Musar tradition. It's definitely tied in. And now that it's 9.50, I'm going to turn it over to one of my teachers, Rabbi Eli Confer. I wish I could stay for a session, but we have our own Slichot service at the synagogue. So Laila Tov, everyone, and thank you. Thank you so much, Rabbi Herman. We so appreciate your teaching this evening. Um, I'm taking so much with me. First, just the idea that maybe we should approach these holidays with presents rather than answers. And um, if we could be, if we invoke God's presence and also invoke our presence with each other as we gather, whether it's online or if we're blessed to be in person, um, can we lend presence to one another rather than trying to lend answers? I, I think that's a really powerful idea that you've introduced. And also, if maybe we, the, you know, we often think of the process that we are going through of tshuva as in some ways trying to manipulate our fates by manipulating God's um, relationship with us. And perhaps um, I, I hear in your teaching also a challenge that tshuva is very important, especially as it restores our relationships with one another. But uh, perhaps uh, the exercise this year is really to come to terms with our lack of control 
and um, to really just invoke our sense of connection to one another in community and to God's presence as a way of helping us through that lack of control and knowledge that, um, that you spoke of so wonderfully. So I really appreciate your teaching. I think we all do. Thank you so much and wishes to you and your family for a Shana Tova Metuka, very sweet and happy new year. And I'm pleased now to uh, turn to our next um, facilitator and teacher for the evening, Rabbi Eli Confer. He's the president and CEO of the Hadar Institute. Eli has previously worked as a journalist, a banker, and a corporate fraud investigator. He's a graduate of Harvard College, and he completed his doctorate in liturgy at the Jewish Theological Seminary, where he was also ordained. He's also received smicha from his longtime teacher, Rav Daniel Landis, in 2018. He's a Wexner Graduate Fellow and DeRote Fellow. Rabbi Confer is a co-founder of the independent minion Kilat Hadar in New York, and has been named multiple times to Newsweek's list of top 50 rabbis in America. He is the author of a wonderful book, Empowered Judaism, What Independent Minyanim Can Teach Us About Building Vibrant Jewish Communities. And he serves on the board of Natan and the advisory board of, the Ups, of Upstart. Uh, he'll be speaking with us this evening on the deeper meaning of Avinu Malkenu. Uh, Rabbi Confer, it's wonderful to have you with us. Thank you so much for being here this evening. I'll also just say that um, my turn as host uh, will end um, and uh, I'm pleased that Rabbi Ellen Wollens Fields, my wonderful colleague from the Women's League of Conservative Judaism will pick up as host following Rabbi Confer's presentation. Rabbi Confer. Great, thank you so much. It's an honor to be with all of you here tonight uh, on this night of Slichot. And uh, my, my hope is that we'll be able to, uh, to look at more, more deeply and unpack for meaning um, the prayer of Inu Malkenu, our father, our king, is often how it's translated. Um, we're both going to get to look at the circumstances under which the story, uh, the story behind the writing of this prayer, which is very unusual because most prayers, you don't actually get the story of how and when they were written. Um, so we're going to get, get to see the story of how this came to be, which is, I think, going to instruct us into what the prayer means. Um, and we're also going to have a, an occasion to look at what it means to call God Avinu, our father, and Malkenu, our king. Uh, all this is going to be looking at some of the sources from our tradition in order to get this deeper insight. Um, so uh, let's start off with the uh, Avinu Malkenu that is in the Ashkenaz tradition and just get ourselves oriented to this, uh, to this prayer. Um, it's one of the longest prayers in terms of a litany, that is to say something that you say over and over again, Avinu Malkenu X. Uh, Avinu Malkenu X comes 44 times in the traditional Ashkenazi liturgy. Uh, and in different communities and also in different traditions, like in Lev Shalem, they've cut back from, from that. Um, but but the, the prayer is fairly long. And possibly the, the reason it's so well known is perhaps the tune that we sing the last line to, Avinu Malkeinu, which is a favorite. And if you don't get that at your high holiday services, you get your money back. Um, and in, in addition to that, it's a very simple prayer, meaning that the Hebrew is, is understandable and the sort of plaintiveness of calling God both a parent and a sovereign um, is, is both you know, powerful in its contrasting images and, uh, and its simplicity. Um, so, uh, so we're, we're going to get to take a look at, um, we'll just take a quick peek at the long version of Avinu Malkenu as we have it in our Machzorim. Um, but then we're going to look at the, the story behind it and get, get, a, get a sense of actually, it was much shorter to begin with, probably no surprise there, and, uh, and the circumstances under which it was written. Um, so let me, I'm just going to share my screen here so we can do this together. Um, Okay, so as you can see, we start off with Avinu Malkenu, Chatanu Lefanecha. Our father, our king, we have sinned before you, as we're going to see in a moment, although that's the opening line for our versions of this prayer, that's not the original opening line. Uh, and that's striking in and of itself. I mean, we, we sort of associate this prayer with an admission of sin. Um, and, and, and of course, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Slichot, these are all times of admitting sin. In the old uh, tradition of the land of Israel, instead of, we, we wake up and say in the morning, 
uh, at least in, in our modern traditions in the prayer book, the thing that you would say in the morning when you woke up in the morning was hatati, simply I sin. Um, so there is something about the, uh, the opening with sin that is appropriate uh, for this kind of a prayer. But at the same time, it's, as we're going to see, it's not the original um, uh, starting point of this prayer. Uh, and, and, and that's probably closer to the Ein Lanu Melech Ela'ata, we have no king but you, as sort of the, 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 the real opener to, to, to the prayer here. But we're gonna, we're gonna see as, you know, I, I brought you the whole thing here just visually so you can see 44 lines is a lot of lines. Um, you know, there are some lines that seem more and less relevant. Some of these were added over the years. Some of them were added after certain pogroms or crusades which seemed to be a sort of an avengeful, you know, take, 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 take revenge on our behalf side of things. I wanted to just highlight one which is relevant for this year. <speaking in Hebrew> Withhold the plague from your inheritance, let us say from your people. Uh, there actually was another version of this line and other versions of Avinu Malkinu that didn't say mena, prevent a plague uh, or withhold, but rather atzor, atzor magifa, stop the plague. Um, and later editors of this door said, well, why would I ask God to stop the plague? I'm asking God to prevent the plague. But now we know the answer. You ask God to stop the plague if you're sitting in the middle of the plague and you'd like it to, to be stopped. So feel free to make that little edit this year if you'd like, instead of mina, you could say atzor. Um, so again, we have 44 lines here, including the Kodvenu Besefer, write us in the book of. Um, there's a lot of ways of trying to explain why it, it is so long. Um, actually, one of the ways in which, uh, in which it was explained to be long was that it was meant to mirror the 19 blessings of the weekday Amida. Um, and there are some similarities in some of the languages to some of the brachot in the weekday Amida. That's also probably the reason why we don't say Avinu Malkenu on Shabbat, um, because it's sort of a weekday, a weekday prayer, as it were, even though that sort of gets mixed up on, on the holidays. Um, but, uh, but this is a very, very long prayer here. And of course, the, the place where we say this prayer on, uh, on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is, uh, as well as normal fast days, is right after the Amida itself. That is to say, once you're, once you're done with, uh, with saying the standard Amida and after the repetition, that's when Avinu Malkenu comes, comes in. I asked my wife earlier, why do you think people, you know, why do you think Avinu Malkenu is such a popular prayer? She said, oh, because people know that when they get to Avinu Malkenu, they're almost done. <laughs> Meaning you've said the Avida and now you're moving on to Avinu Malkenu and you can see the light at the end of the tunnel for the service. Um, but the, the placement here is gonna be important as we see why was it placed at the end of the Amida and what's its function? What is it actually doing here? Um, okay, uh, I, I brought you just for a little variety, not from our version, not from the Ashkenaz version, from, a, from an old French uh, tradition, um, which was preserved in some, some Sidurim from the Middle Ages. Avinu Malkinu Kodvenu Besefer Mizonot, inscribe us in the book of food, literally Mazon. Avinu Malkinu Kodvenu Besefer Rifuot, inscribe us in the book of healing. And Avinu Malkinu Kodvenu Besefer Shalom, inscribe us in the book of peace. Again, the Hebrew here is very simple and understandable. And the, the requests are fairly basic. And in that way, um, you know, sort of relate to some of our deepest uh, concerns and needs that we're trying to sort of organize around on the, uh, on the high holidays. Okay, so what does it mean for us to, uh, to, to look at the story of the writing of this prayer to get a deeper sense of what the prayer means? And that's what we're gonna jump to uh, right now. And I'm gonna give, give you just a little narrative background to, to the story here. The story of Avinu Malkenu has nothing to do with Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, but rather it comes in the section of the Talmud that speaks about the fasting that the, the Jewish community would do in the event of a drought. So if you can imagine uh, a time when the rain is supposed to come, like in the fall and, and winter, but the rain is not coming. And uh, what are you supposed to do if your entire economy, your entire food source is coming from the agricultural? Um, system and there's no rain that's producing food, how are you supposed to react to that? So, um, so the, the tractate of Tani basically says, here's what you do, you, you set a series of fasts. And if the series of fasts don't work out and they have 13 fasts in a row if you, on a Monday and a Thursday, so, so a number of weeks that you're fasting and hoping that the rain will come as a result of the fast. If the fasts don't work, so plan B is to recite a special Amida. Uh, to recite a special 
um, uh, you know, core rabbinic prayer. The normal prayer, as we said, is, uh, is well, originally was 18 brachot, now is 19 brachot. Um, and, it, and on top of those uh, standard brachot, you're going to add another six brachot. You're going to add another six blessings. That's what you do when the fast hasn't brought the rain. Now we're going to turn to a public prayer service where you're making a special amida and six extra, extra brachot. And that's what's going to bring the rain. Now, that's the rule in the mission. We're going to see it in a moment. But what's great about the, the Talmud is it's not just rules, it's also stories. And we're going to see a couple of stories in which this plan didn't work. Neither plan A, the plan of fasting, nor plan B, the plan of the special Amida worked to bring the rain, as you might imagine, which you know, happens in reality. And so what happens then? What happens after that, uh, that situation? And that's going to be the, the locus point for uh, the, the creation of Avinu Malkinu from a narrative standpoint. So let's take a look at these stories together. I'm going to reshare the screen um, so we can do it. Okay, first of all, here's the rule in the Mishnah. The Mishnah, uh, uh, you know, the oldest layer of rabbinic law says, when they have stood up to pray the Amida, they shall, they shall bring before the Ark an elder who is experienced and who has children, but his house is empty so that his heart will be wholly devoted to the Amida. So who is the prayer leader who's gonna lead this most important moment of prayer? It's gonna be someone who is an elder, probably a leader like a Zakain, could also be like the Zakanim in, in, in the Torah, not just someone who old of age, but also someone of stature um, and who has children, but has no means of feeding them. So someone who's really suffering. Okay, So this is the kind of leader that they're putting up there on this day of fast, really to, to pull out the stops in terms of you know, God paying attention and bringing the rain. What happens? He says before them 24 blessings, 18 that are recited every day. The normal Amida has 18, and then they add to those 18 six special for the fast. Okay, so this is the rule, this is the law. Now let's get the, um, the story. And we're gonna actually see two stories in quick succession uh, in the Babylonian Talmud that, that sort of unpack um, the situation when even this uh, special Amida doesn't work. Okay, so let's get the first story. Tanu Rabbanan, we get a story, uh, an ancient story. Ma said, there's a story of Rabbi Eliezer who declared 13 fasts on the public, but no rain fell. Okay, so this is the plan A. Plan A is if there's no rain, you're gonna declare a series of fasts. And indeed the, the fasts go through through all the way um, 13. So, you know, Monday, Thursday, Monday, Thursday, all the way through to get to 13 fasts. Rabbi Eliezer does this. He is a well-respected um, leader of the generation, sort of number one Torah scholar. And nevertheless, it's not working. So at the end of the last fast, this is what happened. The people started to leave. Now, Talmudic stories are a little bit uh, um, ambiguous. You don't know, like, there's not a lot of detail. So where were they and what was causing them to leave? Not totally clear, but wherever they were, they were together and the people started to leave. Rabbi Eliezer says to them as they're leaving, have you prepared graves for yourselves? Um, and then all the people burst into tears and the rain fell. Okay, that's the end of the first story. So the fast is not working. The series of fast is not working. The people are leaving. Let's say they're leaving dejected or unsure or rejecting the leadership perhaps of Rabbi Eliezer. And Rabbi Eliezer sort of blurts out to them, have you prepared graves for yourselves? Which might mean that he's saying we're all doomed or might be sort of, uh, you know, if this is your fault. Something's wrong with the way that you are experiencing these fasts, maybe accusatory. Again, not totally clear in this little snippet what the force of it is, but whatever it is, that's what gets the people to cry. They explode in, in a burst of tears, the Yardu Shamim, and that causes the rain to fall. Okay? So what we have here is action, lead, sort of human action, the crying, the, 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 the water falling from your eyes as a result of an emotional experience that leads to the upper, the upper rains to come down. That's story number one. We haven't come to Avinu Malkinu yet. Now we're getting to our, our prayer, okay? Shuv said, there's another story concerning Rebbe Eliezer where he led the Amida and he said the 24 blessings in the Amida, that is to say, the six additional blessings for, for the fast, but he was not answered, below Nana. 
So again, this is a, a situation of a drought, presumably another year. There's a drought, they go through the fast, the fasts aren't working, they go for the Amida, plan B. He leads the Amida, he's that Zakane, he's that elder who leads in front of everybody, and there's no rain. What happens next? Rabbi Akiva gets up and led after him and said, Gerad Rabbi Akiva Achara Be'amar, he simply says, Avinu Malkeinu, and now I'm taking out the parts in the bracket because the parts in the bracket were added in later manuscripts. So leave out the brackets. Avinu Malkeinu, Ein Lanu Melech Ela Ata. Avinu Malkeinu, Rachem Aleinu. Right, he says two lines. Avinu Malkeinu, our father, our king, we have no king but you, Ein Lanu Melech Ela Ata. Avinu Malkeinu, our father, our king, have mercy on us, Rachem Aleinu. V'yardu Gishamim. And the rain falls. Right, incredible. Um, now, this seems to have the desired outcome, right? You're in a drought, you want the rain to come, everything you've done hasn't worked. Rabbi Eliezer led the Amida as prescribed in the Mishnah, it still doesn't work. Rabbi Akiva then gets up, does something totally off book, right? Completely spontaneous, it seems to be. No mention of saying Avinu Malkenu in the Mishnah or anywhere else. He seems to come up with the words right in the moment. And lo and behold, the rain comes down, okay? So this, this is working. Um, now, look, we're gonna get the coda to the story here, uh, although I just wanna unpack a little bit further um, you know, what, what just happened in that scene. So after the rain comes, what happens? Yatsa vako, a voice comes out from heaven, an echo of a voice, a heavenly voice comes out. Uh, oh, sorry, I skipped the line here. Uh, after he said, after the rain comes, the rabbis, shouted or complained, Niradine Rabbana. The rabbis, the, the assembled uh, leaders, start to shout or complain. Not totally clear what the force of that is, but we're gonna see from context that seems to be some criticism of Rabbi Eliezer, the first guy that, that got up to lead the Amida, who wasn't answered. So they seem to be complaining against him. So a heavenly voice comes out and says, it's not that this one is greater than that one, rather, this one passes over his midot, his character aspects, and this one does not pass over his midot. And now that's the end of the story. Okay, so, so the end of the story is a little co complicated. It's not totally clear what's going on there. We're gonna come back to that in a second, but let's just go back to the action part of the story here for a moment, just so we get the force of it. And we said that Rebbe Eliezer is a great scholar of his generation. Not only is he a great scholar, he is also the teacher of Rebbe Akiva. So just understand what happened in this scene. Rabbi Eliezer, the, the senior rabbi, as it were, gets up and leads the, the congregation in the Amida, in the special Amida that's meant to bring the rain, and he's not answered. And then his student jumps up and steps in and says this spontaneous prayer out of nowhere, and he is answered. Now that is a crazy, uh, a crazy event, because you would imagine that the teacher is the zakein, the teacher is the one who should be answered. And Rabbi Akiva, this sort of uh, the student, but not the one who, who has more honor than Rabbi Eliezer, he should, you know, perhaps hang back or, you know, let the teacher come up with some other solution. But he jumps in there and does what he does, writes this spontaneous prayer and is answered. Um, so there's something chutzpahdik about Avinu Malkeinu, that is to say, it's a prayer that is not the normal Amida, not the prescribed Amida, and not said by the guy who's supposed to be leading the prayers, right? It's said by the young upstart rabbi, and Rabbi Kiva's no slouch, but he's still a student of Rabbi Eliezer at this point. Um, and he, uh, he comes up with his own prayer out of the blue. So just in our experience on the high holidays, when you get to Avinu Malkeinu, it's a little bit like, you know what? We've tried everything else. <laughs> You know, on Yom Kippur, we're fasting, we're saying a very long Amida, and now we get to the end of it, and we're going to try something else, which the spontaneity of it in its origin story from Rabbi Akiva also might explain how so many lines were tacked on as, as it went on through history. This was not something that was written and prescribed in the law codes. This was something that was meant to express our deep, um, you know, in the moment, spontaneous prayer instinct. Uh, and it's said by the person who you wouldn't expect to be answered. You would expect the teacher, not the student to be answered, okay?
So in that way, there's a, um, a, a sort of a very unusual situation that's happening here with Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Eliezer. We're going to look a little deeper into their relationship uh, as we move forward. But let's just figure out what's happening here. Yatsabat Kovamra. After they complain against Rabbi Eliezer, the heavenly voice says, no, it's not that Rabbi Akiva is greater than Rabbi Eliezer. That's not why he was answered. Rather, he is Mavir al Midotav. Rabbi Akiva is passing over his, and we're going to see this means negative attributes, not the Midot that we try to develop, like uh, Rabbi Herman was speaking about, but the negative attributes. And this one does not pass over his negative attributes. That's to say, Rabbi Eliezer has a little bit of an edge to him, whereas Rabbi Akiva is able to model passing over his, um, his, his negative attributes, uh, his, his attributes that uh, might, might lead to, uh, to hurting other people. Okay, so that's the story in the Babylonian Talmud. Now, the great news here is that we also have a parallel story in the Jerusalem Talmud, in the, in the Talmud that is um, the tradition of the land of Israel. So oftentimes you'll see a story that has parallels from the Yushalmi and the, and the Bavli, from the Jerusalem Talmud and the Babylonian Talmud. They're not exactly the same, but you're gonna see that it, there's enough overlap here that we're, we can compare the stories. So let's take a look at the, at, the, at the parallel story in the Yushalmi, also a very short story. Rabbi Eliezer made a fast, but no rain fell. Rabbi Akiva made a fast and the rain fell. Okay, so we have the same dynamic that we had in the Bavli, the same dynamic, but the, um, the, it's not a prayer that's sort of being, being recited here, whereas in the Bavli, it was Abinu Malkenu versus the standard Amida with the extra six blessings. Here, it's just dueling fasts, okay? Um, but, um, and I'm gonna invite, if you have a question, uh, Peter, please just put it in the chat. Rabbi Akiva then entered and said before them, I'll explain it in a parable. So remember, Rabbi Akiva is now gonna explain, why was I answered? And Rabbi Eliezer wasn't. What's it like? It's like a king who had two daughters. One was brazen, chutzpidik, chatzifta, uh, and one was proper, shera. Um, one of them was kosher. Okay, so the king has two daughters. When the brazen one wanted to enter before him, when the chutzpidik one wanted to see the king, he said, yeah, give her what she wants so that she may go away. But when the kosher one wanted to enter before him, when the, when the favored daughter wanted to enter before the king, he was patient because he liked hearing her pleas. Okay, now this is a crazy story theologically. Let's just understand what Rabbi Akiva is trying to say. Rabbi Akiva is saying, right, that I am the chutzpahdik daughter. And the only reason I was answered is because God is saying, oh, get this guy out of here. Yeah. You know, give him what he wants. Let's move on. But Rabbi Eliezer, who is not answered, why is he not answered? Because he's preferred. He's the one who is loved. And why isn't he answered if he's loved? Because the king likes to hear the cries of his daughter that he loves. Now, that's a little bit thick slash, you know, crazy. And indeed, the Tama turns right around and says, wait a minute. Is it permissible to say this? Can you really say that God listens to the prayers, God rejects the prayers of those God loves because God likes hearing the prayers and God answers the prayers of, of the ones that God doesn't love because he just wants to get them out of the way. Is it permissible to say this? No, rather it was to prevent blasphemy of the house of Rabbi Eliezer. So what's the answer to the Talmud here? Rabbi Akiva came up with this parable to explain why he, Rabbi Akiva, the lesser one, the student is answered versus the teacher um, because he knew that he had to give Rabbi Eliezer some honor uh, and explain away why the teacher was uh, ignored by God and why the student was answered. And he was doing this in order to prevent shame, to prevent blasphemy uh, of the people against Rabbi Eliezer. So in this way, it's very similar to the story in the Bavli, except that in the Bavli, it's the voice of heaven that's coming out and saying, you know what? Don't worry about Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Eliezer. It's not that Rabbi Akiva is greater than Rabbi Eliezer. It's just that he has this ability to overcome his negative attributes in certain moments. But Rabbi Eliezer, there's nothing wrong with him. And in the Rishalmi, that same argument is being made, but it's being made not by a voice from heaven, but rather by a voice uh, that is Rabbi Akiva's himself. That it's a Rabbi Akiva 
is rushing to the defense of his teacher, Rabbi Eliezer. Um, now, bringing this to the, the question of how is it that we, um, we experience Avinu Malkenu, Avinu Malkenu is just a moment where you could pick lots of moments in the high holiday liturgy in which you're saying, am I, are my prayers really going to be answered? Like I say, mi yichil, mi amud, who, who shall live and who shall die? Are my prayers to live going to be answered? How are my prayers sort of wrapped up in, uh, it, 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 you know, how are the words coming out of my mouth wrapped up in the possibility of being answered? And what this story is teaching us, or the set of stories is teaching us, is that actually what matters more than the words themselves is the character of the person who is saying them, which is to say, Rabbi Akiva is modeling in some way the generosity of spirit that also brings the rain. Rabbi Akiva is saying, you know, I'm going to take the heat, even though my prayer worked, my fast worked, I'm going to take the heat and say Rabbi Eliezer is really the one who's loved, even though I have to come up with this theology that doesn't totally make sense in order to say that. Um, but I am somebody who is, um, who is answered because of my ability to make sure I respect my elders and because I'm able to pass over my I'm able to pass over my midot. So there's something about Rabbi Akiva as the actor here, the leader of the prayers. It's not a magic formula that's coming out of his mouth. Oh, a spontaneous prayer after the Amida, that's what works. It's actually about the character and the life that he leads. That's what's helping Rabbi Akiva be answered. Um, and I think, of course, no prayer, there's no magic formula to getting your prayer answered. That was true now as much as it was in the Talmudic times. But I think part of the lesson of the story is that the behavior that we demonstrate is as much uh, the, the part of the, um, you know, the reason that something would be answered than any specific formula that I might say. In other words, not that the formula of Inu Malkenu is better than the standard Amida, but when you're paying attention to the actual uh, source of the words, the person who's standing there, that's somebody that, uh, that's something that's going to be um, uh, the, the real issue here. And I want to look at this because it also touches on the experience of God and what God is also struggling with in, in these moments of prayer. Uh, and, and, uh, and then we'll jump quickly to look at Avinu and Malkenu as terms that are understood in, in certain ways. So let me just reshare the screen here. We're going to take a look at, um, I'm scrolling on down to page eight. Um, First of all, Rashi tells us, Hamavir al what does it mean for someone to pass over his midot? She'eno midaktek limdod mida. He plays on the word mida. He's not very uh, exacting in measuring out limdod, retaliation for those who trouble him. Rather, he sets aside his retaliation and moves on, right? Ma'avir al means you can forgive people who offend you, right? And that's what apparently Rabbi Akiva has as a character trait. And apparently Rabbi Eliezer does not have as a character trait. And in that way, actually, there's a lot of stories of Rabbi Eliezer and his sort of prickly side. Um, he's not someone who's ma'avir al midotav. He's not someone who sets aside uh, his retaliations. He's very exacting with his students and with his community. Um, he's potentially excommunicated from the rabbis for that reason or partly for that reason. But that's something that Rabbi Akiva is modeling. So Rabbi Akiva is the one who's modeling, I'm gonna set aside my retaliations and that's why my prayer is answered. Now this is actually uh, indeed what God is struggling with as well. And we get a, a, a beautiful uh, midrash about the, the inner prayer life of God here. Um, we learn that God prays. And what does God pray? In other words, God says the Amida. What does it mean for God to say the Amida? What does God's Amida look like? So we get this report. Rav Zutra bar says in the name of Rav, may it, this is God's prayer. May it be my will, yi ratzon mil fanai, may it be my will before me. That, what? <clears throat> that sheikh b'shura chamayat kasai, that my mercy will conquer my anger. V'yagolu rachamai al midotai, and my mercies shall override my midot, my attributes. That's the thing about ma'avir al midotav, overcoming my attributes. And I will behave with my children through the attribute of mercy and go above the letter of the law with them. So I'm not going to judge them by the strict letter of the law, but I'm going to be merciful to them 
This is God's prayer. And this is indeed, God wants to be ma'avir al-midotav. God wants to be merciful and overriding God's instinct to, uh, to retaliate. And the model of how to do that is Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva is the one who demonstrates through his behavior and his actions um, that he actually embodies that ability. And then we see here a world in which the recitation of the Amida is less about asking God for something and more about putting up the model of the kind of person that is going to represent the actions we want God to do. Okay, so when you think about choosing the prayer leader for high holidays or how are we embodying prayer, um, it's less about what we're saying and more about what kind of person are we? Are we able to set aside our retaliations? And that's gonna be sort of a earthly model, as it were, a sort of a lead move in which we hope God will follow just like God does by releasing the rain in these stories of the, of the fast. Okay, so this is the, the narrative background to Avinu Malkeinu. Avinu Malkeinu, what I'm arguing here is, it's a moment for us to experience a self-check of am I ma'avir al-midotai? Am I somebody who passes over my retaliations like Rebbe Akiva? Or am I holding my grudges like Rabbi Eliezer, in which case I might not be answered? And if I want God to be merciful to me, then perhaps I also need to be merciful to those who I would otherwise want to retaliate against. Um, okay, in our final few minutes together, I want to look at the use of Avinu and Malkenu. And both of them are powerful images. Um, let's look briefly at Avinu. What does it mean to call God Father, our Father? Um, so one of the classic places in which God is called father is sort of the reverse description in, in Deuteronomy. We just read this a few weeks ago in the, in the Torah cycle. You are children to Adonai, your God. If you're the children, then God is the father. Okay, so we got a debate about how to interpret this verse. Is what the Torah says. We have a debate between Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Yehuda says, when you comport yourself as children, you are called children. But when you do not behave as children, then you are not called children. That is to say, Rabbi Yudha says, you know what? It's all dependent on your, how you are behaving. Behaving like someone who is the child of God, then you are the child of God. But you can violate that relationship. You can actually break that bond where God is the parent and you're the child if you do the kind of behavior that breaks that bond. That is to say, it's not a forever bond. That's Rabbi Yudah's opinion. But Rabbi Meir actually goes the other way and says, no, actually, no matter what you do, you are still God's child. God is still your, your parent, your father. Rabbi Meir says, in either instance, you're called children. Then he brings a variety of proof texts in which Israel is criticized but they're still called children of God in the criticism, right? As in, they are foolish children, children without faith, seed, children of evildoers, perverse children. And instead of being said of them, you are not my people, it will be said of them, children of the living God. In the end, they're going to be banim atem l'adonai lo'echem. So this is sort of depends on what you want to, what metaphor you want to take into the high holidays. But when I call God Avinu, if you're Rabbi Yudi, you're saying, well, God's only my parent if I behave well. But we may say, actually, there's something deeper about this relationship that has nothing to do with my behavior, just like a parent-child relationship in real life. No matter how the child behaves, they're always the child of the parent. And that's perhaps the metaphor that we could draw on here. Avinu is calling God, reminding God that we have an unbreakable bond, even if our actions sometimes violate the expectations that God wanted from us. Avinu, you are always in relationship with us, no matter what our behavior is. So that's one, one rabbinic take on Avinu. I want to look at the rabbinic take on Malkenu. And, and to, to just end with this, Malkenu, Melech, when we call God a king, um, in some ways, for at least for um, contemporary Americans, that's a hard image to get behind. Right, because we, when we think of a king, we think of sort of like a despot, or you know, like the king of England, uh, you know, who was uh, who we rebelled against as a country. Um, calling God a king is a hard, uh, hard metaphor sometimes to get behind. And what I want to demonstrate is that, in fact, the king that the rabbis had us call God that that 
metaphor of calling God a king was whatever you think a king that is human stands for, God is the opposite. Okay, so if you don't like a human king, then perfect, because God is the opposite of the human king. And I'll just give you a couple of examples of that we'll do to close off. Okay, so I'm going to share the screen one last time. Let's take a look at the end. Um, a king of flesh and blood. If a person has a burn on him, or if a poor person asks after his welfare, it's a degradation to him, and he doesn't respond, right? You can imagine. If a, you know, if, a, if a human king was approached by somebody who is not, not part of his social class, right? He has, a, he has a, a physical mark on him or he has a socioeconomic mark on him. The king doesn't respond. But God, it's not so. All are accepted by him. As, and he says, praise me, it's good before me. As it says, it's good to sing to our Lord, right? Everybody has the opportunity to stand before God. It's not dependent on your body or on your social status. Everybody can stand before God. And that way, a human king and, and God as king are the opposites of each other. So what I'm saying, Avinu Malkainu, when I'm saying the Malkainu, whatever I think uh, the pettiness of a human king is, the opposite is what I mean when I say God is king. Let's look at another example. Um, we have this, uh, this word in the book of Psalms, La Menatzea which is a hard word to translate, often translated as for the leader or for the conductor. But la menatzeach can also be uh, pronounced another way. Menatzeach means to be victorious. And you could pronounce it in the active form, like for the victor. But actually la menutzach is how this, this midrash reads it. For the one who is defeated, the one who is vanquished by his creations. Now let's get the comparison. A flesh and blood king, if you defeat him, he's angry, right? Human kings don't like to be beaten. But God is the opposite. Defeat God and God is happy. As it says, therefore God said that God would, would destroy them had not Moses chosen, his chosen one stood before him in the breach. That is to say, Moshe defeats God, arguing on behalf of the children of Israel in order to save them. God is defeated and God loves it because God didn't want to destroy the Jewish people. So when Moshe defeats God, that's actually a positive thing for God. So this is another example. And there are many examples of this rabbinic literature where a human king is X, God is the opposite of X, God is negative X. So what I'm arguing here is when we say Avinu Malkenu, the Malkenu, the Melech part of God that I'm reciting, when I'm calling God king, whatever hangups I have with human kings, I'm putting those aside and saying God is the opposite. Whatever, whatever it means for, for a person to be a king, God actually embodies the opposite characteristics there. So when I say Avinu, I'm saying we have an unbreakable bond following Rebbe Mayer. No matter what my actions are, God is in relationship with me. And when I'm saying Malkano, I'm saying whatever pettiness human kings show, God is the opposite. And that's the being that I'm appealing for in this, uh, in this prayer. I wanna thank you all for taking the time to study Avinu Malkenu tonight, and uh, look forward to learning with you more either here or uh, at Hadar, hadar.org, where I normally teach. Thank you, and turning it back over to Ellen. Thank you, Rabbi Confer and Yashikoch, to you. We really enjoyed your teaching. I think I'm going to uh, try to print out the teaching, your source sheet, so I have something that I can look at during services and just add it to my repertoire of learning. So Yashikoch to you. So it's a pleasure to be with everyone this evening, especially I want to do a little shout out to my Women's League for Conservative Judaism sisters. I'm the executive director of Women's League for Conservative Judaism. Jacob introduced me briefly earlier. And I am um, something I did twice this week. I'm pinch hitting for somebody who is going to be teaching. And Alana Garber got me, who's one of my best friends. Best friends can do this when you're sitting at the beach. And she's like, can you teach tomorrow night? Like this was Friday. I was like, sure, I always have something I could teach. So I'm very proud to be able to teach. I was sitting at the beach with my daughter <coughs> and son. She's going off to um, Nativ on Monday they leave. And this teaching really makes me think about some of the issues that have come up this year that many of us have dealt with because of um, COVID and the different 
decisions we have to make because of how we balance our observances and what we need to do in order to live in the real world. So I'm going to share my screen. I hope you could see it. Rabbi Mark, good friend of mine, you see it? Just give me a nod. Okay, good. I'm gonna put it on present mode so everyone can see it better. And why was I able to, besides be, uh, because Alana is one of my closest friends and I needed to help her out here for 10 minutes today, besides introducing, why did I have this prepared so quickly? Because as the executive director of Women's League for Conservative Judaism, every day we used to have a session with all of our women throughout North America, starting, I remember the exact day, May, March 13th, 2020, to give the opportunity for women to, and anybody, to say Kaddish, and we were studying together. So since March, we have completed the entire book of Psalms. We had a Seum. We completed the entire tractate of Pirkei Avot, and we had a Seum. It used to be that we met six days a week, not Shabbos, for a half hour, basically, for women to get together across time zones. On, and if you want to join us, you still can, but we moved it to five days. And then once the world's opening up a little more, now we do it three days a week. So Tuesdays, I teach Mishnah Rosh Hashanah. I had this crazy idea we'd have a seum before Rosh Hashanah. We have not gotten that far, so no seum then. We'll see when we have the seum. On uh, Tuesdays, our colleague Rabbi, from the Rabbinical Assembly, Rabbi Margie Sella, who is our Educational Programming Director at Women's League uh, Coordinator, she teaches um, uh, Mishle Proverbs. And on Fridays, we do Parshat Shavua. So let's get to the mission of Rosh Hashanah right now. I just used three of my minutes of my 10. So this is the last teaching in chapter one. I'll read it in English so we're all on the same page with one caveat beforehand. Mishnah Rosh Hashanah has 35 teachings in it and 17 of them have to do with Kiddush HaChodesh. What is that? The sanctification of the month because back then they didn't have calendars. They had to figure out when people saw the moon and people would have to come to the Beit Din, the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem and give testimony as to whether or not it was the new moon. And then all the holidays were decided. So it was very important to know exactly when the new moon would be. And what could happen if someone happened to see the new moon and it would take them on a journey that they would be journeying over Shabbat. So it was so important to give the testimony about the new moon, yet they might have to desecrate Shabbat to do that. Or worse, what will happen if they're traveling? So here's this Mishnah. With regard to one who saw the new moon, but is unable to go to Jerusalem by foot because he's sick or has difficulty walking, others may bring him on a donkey or even in a bed, even on Shabbat if necessary. So here's the situation. The person who actually saw the new moon isn't well. He himself, and it was all he's because they didn't have any women giving testimony, couldn't go himself. But he saw it was so important for everybody else to know the new moon that it was going to be, that he saw it, the moon. So what would happen? Even if he was sick and he had difficulty walking, someone else could actually desecrate Shabbat and be able to carry him on a bed or a donkey. And if the witnesses are concerned that bandits may be lying in wait for them along the road, they may take clubs or other weapons in their hands, even on Shabbat. So what's here? Now we're saying, okay, so they can travel and you can almost hear somebody in between saying, but what happens when they're traveling and it's dark out and there are people who want to attack them? They're bandits on the way. How will they, how will they defend themselves while they're walking? Well, they said, they could even desecrate Shabbat by carrying a weapon with them, the Mishnah says, and the Gemara is going to go into it further about what actually happens. You could carry something in your hand to defend yourself. So now anything you can carry and you can also travel. And if it was a long journey to Jerusalem, they may take sustenance with them, although it's ordinarily pro prohibited to carry on Shabbat, since for a distance of a walk of a night and a day, the witness may desecrate Shabbat and go out to give testimony to determine the start of the month. So now that you can hear someone saying in between these comments, like a question of, okay, so they're traveling a long time. They can travel, they can carry weapons if someone attacks them. But what about food? You get hungry. If you're going to maintain your, they didn't have cars to go. They were going to go for a really long time. It's hot, possibly it's a desert area. Could they carry food? And they said, even that they could do, they could carry food. So 
then you need a text to prove it. This is as it is stated in Leviticus chapter 23. These are the festivals of the Lord, sacred gatherings which you shall declare in their seasons. Why are they doing all this, someone might be asking. Because it's so important to decide the new moon that we need to know when all the holidays are going to be. That's why you can do this. This teaches that in all cases, the festivals must be fixed at their proper times, even if it entails the transgression of Torah prohibitions. So that's a big statement there saying that even you can desecrate and not do certain things in the Torah to transgress Torah, transgress Torah prohibitions because it's so important to know when the ho holidays are going to be. So this is an ancient text that our women studied this week with me at Makombi Ahad with Women's League. And I wanted to bring it here because it really teaches us a number of things that many of us might be dealing with. Some of them are comparisons and some of them are slightly different. In this day and age, we're thinking about different things that we need to do in life that are mitzvot, but we might need to do things a little differently. So for example, many of us are the conservative movement, we're very grateful, I'm on the Committee on Jewish Law and Standards, has said in the Shad HaDachak, in the pressing hour, you can have a service on Zoom. Now, some might say, I told you earlier, my daughter's leaving on Nativ, on, uh, and many of you might have children or grandchildren or people in your community leaving on Nativ, our gap year program in Israel on Monday. And now it's a rule that you need to actually get your COVID test 72 hours beforehand. So quite honestly, it's a mitzvah to visit Israel. It's a mitzvah for these children to live in Israel, these young adults, to live in Israel for a year. So what do you do if you have to have your COVID test 72 hours? There's no guarantee those 24, 48 hour tests are gonna come in. Can you actually do something on Shabbat to, to perpetuate you visiting Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel, Medina Yisrael, the state of Israel? How many of us have had to do things because of that? Think of it more so, pikuach nefesh, for your health. I spoke to someone last week that said in order for her to have her surgery done, she needed to have a COVID test 72 hours before. And when was that? That was Shabbat. But it was pikuach nefesh for her to have to go to get the COVID test. This mission is teaching us here that in ancient times, in order to do certain mitzvot, and I know it might be radical for me to say that pikuach nefesh, taking care of yourself, is a mitzvah. Visiting the land of Israel, studying in the land of Israel is a mitzvah. But sometimes in the modern life, you have to do some things that you don't usually do. You might say it's transgressing Shabbat. But our ancient ancestors had to do that too. They're saying in this Mishnah that because it was so important to testify to the new moon, that they were able to travel on Shabbat. They were able to carry on Shabbat. This is like radical, in my opinion, to then see how these ancient texts are saying certain things that we are dealing with today. That modern life, and we might look at these texts and say, oh, what do they mean to me now? But truly, they mean so much, and they're applicable to today. We have so many things going on now that we would have never thought about. Who would have thought that in order to visit the lands of Israel, in order to get a test, I, an operation, you'd have to make these decisions. Do I go to the hospital? Do I go to the doctor to, for a simple test on Shabbat? Can I carry things with me on Shabbat? And this mission is saying, you know what? Yes, in ancient times, they would carry things to defend themselves so that they could go and testify for Shabbat, for the new moon to be able to be able to celebrate our holidays. So we should really look at it also, and I need to wrap up because I need to introduce our next speaker, that we're blessed today. Who has to look anywhere to know if there's a new moon? You just pick up, I don't know if you're gonna see in my, virt my, my virtual background, a calendar diary from Women's League or the calendar from United Synagogue. You can't see it with my virtual background, sorry. We don't have to go out and have people testify yet anymore about the new moon, because we have our calendars, how things have changed and how things are also the same. So I do know that there are a number of uh, uh, chat comments in the chat. I'm going to try to look at them at the same time as getting back to my screen so I can introduce our next speaker. And give me just one moment. It is such a pleasure to be here this evening. I looked around the screen 
to see who was here. And I see many of my women and my sisters from Women's League and my people who I share the congregation with as Corrigan at Congregation Torah L in Oakhurst. And I am hoping that I have not looked yet, but that Rabbi Paul Carbell, our next speaker, is on as well. He is. He is. He's here. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you to Alana Garber, Rabbi Alana Garber, who you just heard her voice, who has put this all together. So yashikach to you. So Rabbi Paul Carbell is from Temple Beth El Mekor Chaim. He's a rabbi in Cranford, New Jersey. He's thrilled to return to teach at his second Slichot night live, beginning his 37th year of rabbinic service and third year as rabbi of Temple Beth El Mekor Chaim. Paul serves as a member of the steering committee of the Jewish Federation of Metro West's New Rabbinic Roundtable, as a member of the New York, New Jersey Region Adversary Board of the Anti-Defamation League, and the Global Community Committee of UJA Federation of New York. A member of the Board of Governors of the New York Board of Rabbis, Rabbi Kerbel serves as Rabbinic Campaign Chair of the Schechter Institutes of Jerusalem in Tel Aviv, one of Israel's leading Judaic and academic institutions of higher learning. And we look forward to having Rabbi Kerbel teach us this evening on the topic of casting away your sins, Tashlich, in the Jewish tradition. Thank you so much, Ellen. Thank you, Rabbi Alana, for arranging this beautiful evening. Shavua Tov to everyone, Shana Tova. And I wish everyone a Ketiva Vachatima Tova. I hope everyone has a very meaningful holiday. This has been a difficult uh, 18 months for us, and we're still not out of it, but we have hope and we look forward to the promise of a new year. So, my job in the next um, 27 minutes is to tell you everything you want to know about Tashlech. I'll start with a little parody of the Brady Bunch. Here's a story of a crazy Jewish people who throws bread to fish in the sea. Um, and that's what we do. We throw bread into the water on Tashlech. And I would like to share with you a little bit of learning about Tashlech and why we do it. First, to start off, we have to understand the role that water plays in the Jewish tradition. And I only need to share with you just a few lines from a wonderful book that was published a couple of years ago. Uh, it's been shared, I think, by JNF and by APAC, Let There Be Water by Seth Siegel, who's a men member of the Council of Foreign Relations. This is what he says in his book about the role that Israel plays with water. Although most of the Jews in Israel today are not strict in their religious observance, culture and tradition are enduring phenomena. The religious culture that carried the Jewish people for 2,000 years from exile to national rebirth is filled with reverence for water in the form of rain and dew. These water-focused scriptural episodes aren't outliers. Linguistically, the Hebrew Bible is a moisture-suffused document. The word dew is mentioned 35 times. The word flood is mentioned 61 times and the word cloud shows up 130 times. The word water itself is found 600 times in the Hebrew Bible. I believe it was Rabbi Arthur Waskow in his book, Seasons of Our Joy, that helps to bring Tashlich and water into focus at this time of year. He notes in his book that the High Holy Days is bracketed by stories of water and by stories of casting. The first story that we read in the Torah reading on the first day of Rosh Hashanah is what? The casting out of Hagar and Ishmael out of the home and the issue relating to having enough water. And of course, God hears the cry of the boy where he is and then opens Hagar's eyes. God doesn't create a well out of nothing. The well is there. It just is one of the many themes and messages of the High Holy Days. Sometimes we can't see what's in front of us, but the casting of Hagar out of the home begins our High Holy Days. And then on Yom Kippur, of course, we read the story of Jonah and several castings. His being cast, hurled into the water when the people on the boat realize that the storm is all because of Jonah. And then in his own prayer, 
uh, in chapter uh, two of the book of Jonah, the word Tashlif appears. We also have in the middle of the High Holy Days, the beautiful Haftarah. It's the only time, right? Uh, I believe in our tradition that we have selections from three prophets in one Haftarah, one of which we will look at in a few moments. So tonight I'd like to share with you some of the amazing things about Tashla. The first thing I want you to all know is the importance of the power of us, the people, because the rabbis in the Middle Ages did not love the custom. Many of them did not love the custom of Tashla. There was another custom that they didn't like as well, many rabbis, and that is the custom of having Yiskor on the on Yom Kippur and at the end of each of the holidays. Why for Yiskor was there a problem? Because it was Zaman Simpatenu. It was supposed to be happy, joyous celebrations and Yiskor, of course, puts a damper uh, in that mood. But with Tashlich, I think we can all figure out what the issue is. Some of the rabbis didn't like the mitzvah of, or the custom of Tashlich because we would spend more time worrying about the bread and the water and less time doing uh, actual teshuva and thinking about how to be better people. One of the major sources on the history of Tashlich is a paper here, which I had copied many years ago as a, a young rabbi visiting the Jewish Theological Seminary Library, which I did at least once or twice a year for all the years of my rabbinate until Recently, the library was out of commission. And this is a paper by Professor Jacob Lauterbach. It appeared in the Hebrew Union College Annual of 1936. And it's a 140 day paper, 140 page paper on the customs of Tashlik. So Professor Lauterbach did a lot of research into this from Hebrew Union College. And one of the things he tells us, where does this come from? Is that the mitzvah, the custom of doing Tashlich began in the Middle Ages in Europe. It was customary, according to his research, for Jews, most of our Jewish communities were on bodies of water. Why? Because if you can't live in the land of Israel, then the next holiest place is a body of water. We all know the importance of purity, ritual purity in our tradition of mitvah, and water is considered to be uh, an important place to live next to. And so Jews lived often by seas and by rivers. And he noted that it was a custom in many communities, especially in Germany, to go down to a body of water for each of the holidays, it wasn't just for Rosh Hashanah. And that there was a custom when children were inaugurated into their Torah study at the age of five to have a ceremony in the synagogue and then go down to one of the rivers in Germany uh, call it baptism, call it just going down to a body of water, but to inaugurate their study into Torah study. So what happened was the visit to the water of most of our major festivals got condensed into Tashlich and became a very popular thing. And one of the sources on the source sheet that, uh, I will, sh that will be shared with you in a moment is the first mention is the Maharil, Rabbi Yaakov ben Moshe Levi Molin, who lived in the 15th century and was a rabbi in Mainz, Germany. And he's the first to mention this custom. So let's look at the um, sources, if they can be put up for me. And uh, we will see in our... Sources. Um, Paul, yes. you can share it if you'd like, or uh, we put the link in the chat for everybody. Okay. Um, so if you um, would like to look at it, you can uh, access the things because we have such limited time. I just want to share a few of the basic ideas with you. Um, and you've, also, if you have a Eitz Chaim Chumash, you can follow along. But of course, the sources for Tashla. Casting out Hagar, page 114, chapter 21, the Torah reading for uh, Rosh Hashanah, uh, casting out the slave woman, 
uh, from beforehand the issue of water. And we also have the story, which is the Maftir Torah reading for the first day of Rosh Hashanah of the dispute between Abraham and Avimelech over a well of water. So water is a very important theme here in our, um, in our Torah readings for Rosh Hashanah. I'd like to uh, also point out to you um, that um, the word Tashlif appears a number of times in our tradition, in the book of Jonah and in the prophet Micha. Um, and so if you'll look at So if you'd like to look at the book of Jonah, you'll see the beautiful, I mean, just this amazing story, right? What does Jonah do? He's asked to go to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, which is to his east. And what does he do? He goes down to Jaffa and heads in the opposite direction. He gets on a ship in Jaffa, one of the most ancient port cities in the world and a storm envelops only the ship and everyone is praying to God except for guess who, Jonah and the captain and the sailors ask him, well, who are you? And he goes, I think this is because of me because I'm running away from God. And he says to them, I'm a Hebrew. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made both the seas and the land. And um, Jonah uh, then tells them to cast him off the ship. Um, you must heave me overboard and the sea will come down for you. For I know this terrible storm came upon my account. And then if we look further into the book of Jonah, we read the, the song that Jonah sings within the Dag Hagadol, the big fish. And he says, Karati mitsarali et Adonai v'yaneni mi beten sho'ol shavati shamata koli betashlicheni, the word tashlich, betashlicheni mitsula. You cast me into the depths, into the heart of the sea. And so the word tashlich appears here and then again later on in the prophet Micha. So what is tashlich? The custom is, of course, to go down to a body of water, preferably a free flowing body of water on the first day of Rosh Hashanah. If the first day of Rosh Hashanah is Shabbat, in most communities, Tashlich is performed on day two. But it's my understanding today that most people feel that if you can't do Tashlich on Rosh Hashanah on the first two days, anytime up until Yom Kippur, you can do Tashlich just like at our congregation in Marietta, Georgia. We went down to the park near the synagogue during one of our preschool days and had a beautiful tashlich with our children between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Now, what happens if you don't have water? Um, in Jerusalem and in Egypt, by the way, tashlich was always observed on the first day, even when it fell on Shabbat. In Jerusalem, where there are no lakes and rivers, right? Where do you think they went? They went to the cisterns right around the old city. In Safat, there's no water around Safat. What do they do? They look down at Hagalil, the Sea of Galilee, the Kinneret, and just look at the water and fulfill Tashlich that way. Um, uh, and the Jews of Yemen observe Tashlich at the mikvah, and Kurdish Jews actually leapt into the water, right? Most places you would be arrested if you tried to leap into a fountain or a pond or whatever. Um, and the Hasidim in Galicia set little floats of straw onto the water and set them afire with candles and rejoice as their sins were either burned or washed away. So our custom is on Rosh Hashanah afternoon to go down to a body of water to bring some bread with us and to recite some of the prayers. Among the most famous is in the Haftarah for Shabbat Shuvah, the Shabbat of repentance between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, which we'll look at in a moment, and to recite a variety of other Psalms. Now, some people, actually some of the rabbis say you don't really 
bring a loaf of bread, you just put some crumbs in your pocket and you open your, uh, the, your pockets inside out and dangle them into the water. What is the reason why Tashlich was done at a river? It was preferable to have a river with, um, uh, as I mentioned before, free flowing water with fish in it. And among the many customs is, since the eyes of fish never close, they symbolize the unblinking eyes of God reviewing our behavior. The fish thereby serve as witnesses of our repentance and represent the presence of God. We are also compared to fish caught in a net because just as fish are sometimes caught in a net, we are caught on Rosh Hashanah uh, in the Unatana Tokef prayer, right? With a God between the seat of justice and mercy. La'el Orech Din, one of our beautiful PU team. The custom was in earlier times to recite it one day in the Shachari and one day in the Musaf, because we didn't know, according to the Talmud, God spends part of the day right on the Kisei, on the throne of justice, and part of the day on the throne of mercy. We weren't sure exactly when God switches from one throne to the other. So in some communities, you recite Le'el Orech Din about our judge and being judged at different parts of the service. And so we are caught in a net of judgment and we gaze at the river to contemplate our repentance. And finally, a fish's fate precarious and uncertain reflects our own vulnerabilities and help us to get into the mood for repentance. We shake out our pockets as a means of transferring our sins to the fish. I think it's also important to point out the connection between Tashlich on Rosh Hashanah and Pesach. What do we do on Pesach with our bread? It's forbidden. We are supposed to rid it of our homes. We are supposed to physically remove chametz from our homes for Pesach. I would like to suggest that the taking of bread down to a body of water is getting rid of our spiritual chametz. We are getting rid of our boastfulness and our inability to change and think about how we can be better people and go down to uh, a body of water and help to begin the process of repentance. One of the beautiful Midrashim, which may have been the source of the custom of Tashle, is in the Midrash Tankuma. And it is about how just as Abraham was going up the mountain to bring Isaac, uh, as a sacrifice, Satan does not want Abraham to be able to fulfill the mitzvah that he believes that God has commanded to him. And so as Abraham is about to cross over a body of water, Satan makes it flow so heavily that Abraham can't get across. And he cries out to God because he wants to fulfill the commandment. What should he do? And thereupon in the Midrash, God orders the waters to recede, and Abraham continues on his way. Abraham's dedication to doing this mitzvah is seen as the true test, not the actual binding of Isaac on the altar. I'd like for you to turn now to the book of Jonah. And if you look in your chumash, or if you are able to open the source sheets, One of the main sources of the word Tashlich appears. It's in the Eitz Chaim Humash on page 1239. Prophet Micha, chapter 7, verse 18. Mi el kamocha, no se avon. Who is a God like you, forgiving iniquity? The over al pesha, lisherit nachlato. And remitting transgression, who has not maintained his wrath forever. And in the course of the Haftarah, we say, B'tashlich bimsulot yam. You will hurl, O God, all of our sins into the depths of the sea. You will keep faith with Jacob, loyalty to Abraham, as you promised. Asher nishpata la'avotenu mimekedem, as you promised on oath to our fathers in days gone by. 
Tashlip is an opportunity for us to celebrate the potential to change our ways. We are not doomed to do the same thing forever. We have an opportunity to actualize our prayers on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur by going down to a river and sharing uh, the opportunity of repentance. I'd like to conclude with a beautiful poem by Rabbi Herschel Jonah Matt, which was published in the Reconstructionist magazine many years ago, which incorporates many of the things I've shared with you today. Rabbi Matt wrote, standing by the water, emptying our pockets of the remaining crumbs of sin, we turn to you, O God, creator of heaven and earth, creator of the water. We pour out like water the confession of our sin. Hear our prayer and tashlich, cast all of our sins into the ocean steps. As you appear to grieving exiled Hagar, who in desperation had cast her thirsting child under the bushes and assured her at the well of water that you, the living God, look mercifully upon the afflicted, look upon us in our affliction, and tashlich, cast all of our sins into the ocean depths. As Abraham and Isaac, on their way to Mount Moriah, confronted by an impassable river, the guise that Satan took to deter them from fulfilling the command of your dreaded test, march boldly into the water, so strengthen our faith and our trust that we may pass whatever test you set for us, O God. Tashlich, cast all of our sins into the ocean depths. As you sustain our people Israel, your people Israel with the never failing well of water that accompany them through Miriam's merit in their desert wandering. So save us and sustain us with your living water and tashlich cast all of our sins into the ocean depths. As fish in water are ever in danger of being caught and then devoured, so are we in peril constantly. Tashlich, cast all of our sins into the ocean depths. Let these waters be a token of your covenant promise. As I swore that Noah's waters never again would flood the earth, so I swear that I will not be angry with you or rebuke you. For though the mountains may move and the hills may be shaken, my steadfast love shall never move from you, O people of Israel, nor my covenant of shalom be shaken. Says Hashem, your compassionate one, so, Tashlich, cast all of your sins into the ocean depths. As we gather on Rosh Hashanah or whenever we are able to observe the custom of Tashlich, let us remember that this is a wonderful opportunity for us to personalize our own teshuva and share how we can change in the coming year and know that the power of the people with rabbis who in the Middle Ages did not love this custom, but the power of our desire to be with community, to gather as a group um, by a body of water can help to transform our lives and make Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, our 10 days of repentance so meaningful for all of us. Shana Tova to everyone. And I think there, are, if there's opportunity for people to ask questions, I'm happy uh, to answer or try to answer them. By the way, I think I think Ned is on. I want to point out this beautiful Tashlich postcard that was prepared in 2004 uh, from the United States of Conservative Judaism. I'd love to see us re, uh, reproduce this for the future. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing to bring down to Tashlich for everyone. Thank you, Rabbi Kerbel. One question that Juliana Goldberg asked is, do we throw the breadcrumbs before or after saying the Tashlich prayers? Um, well, usually in Judaism, we say our prayers first and then we do the action, right? Hamotzi, we say Hamotzi and then we uh, eat the challah. Uh, we say the prayer over the wine and then we drink the wine. So I would suggest and what I've seen, although I'm not sure that there's a halakha on this, is that we say our prayers first and then um, uh, throw some breadcrumbs into the water, but also take a few moments of personal reflection and quiet, you know, moments of silence to think about how we can change in the coming year. Thanks for the great question. 
Thank you. I don't see any more questions in the chat. If people do have questions, the easiest way, instead of scrolling through nine pages of our pictures here, is to use the hand raise signal if you have any other questions. There was one question there, um, uh, Rabbi Ellen. There was a question about is it more important to have free flowing water or fish? Um, so, you know, if you have a lake or a river that, uh, you know, that usually would have fish in them, I think that's more appropriate. Um, if the only lake near you is a man-made lake or, you know, something in a, in a built community, planned community, you can certainly use it. Um, luckily, right down the street from my congregation in Cranford is the Rahway, the great mighty Rahway River, which luckily didn't flood last week during Henry. It, just, it hurt our synagogue uh, many years ago. Uh, flooded our basement, but um, there is the Rahway River, River, and we go down to a very nice waterfall there. And uh, I've been fortunate, I think, everywhere I've lived to to have a body of water close by to walk to. Uh, but um, I think the important thing is just the is that you try to do the mitzvah even if it's not perfect. And another question was if someone, if you can uh, use a koi pond. Sure. If you can't travel during COVID. If you can, you know, whatever whatever you have available. As I mentioned earlier, in 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 Sfat, they just simply look down at the Sea of Galilee. So so they obviously you have to make do with what is situation you have. Thank that you I about, uh, sorry, quick question. Would you be able to send me the prior that you just read and I'll uh, make it into a link that I can send to everyone? Yes, I would be happy to email it. Unfortunately, I'm happy to share it. It was from Reconstructionist Magazine. I don't have the, the detail on what year, but I'm happy to share this from Rabbi Matt. It's a lovely, lovely poem, which I give out uh, at my Tashlik service. So happy to share. Thank you, Rabbi Alana. Thanks. It looks like we have a yeah. hand. Yeah. Um, and whatever's available could mean an indoor plumbing system, someone asked. <laughs> uh, you know what? Um, so we're going to do a little program on the first day of religious school with our Gan Katan, our youngest children. And we're going to have a little a waiting pool from someone's backyard. So, you know, whatever works for people, whatever is available to you. And Chava has her hand up. If you wanted to unmute yourself and ask a question. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, me growing up, uh, I got this uh, um, impression about Tashlich that the idea was to uh, uh, empty the, the pockets after a whole year of you know crumbs and stuff that were accumulating there from over the year and were not clean anymore. And the, the symbol was like, you know, you, you empty, you, you turn over to the right. other side, your, your uh, pockets and you get rid of whatever was accumulating there and being uh, not clean. But here right. I see they're bringing uh, fresh bread to the river and, and to the body of water and throwing to yeah. the fish. So I don't understand where did this say, uh, you know, this is, was new to me when I came to America. So if you can, I don't understand why you I, have this I two, think, two things. Yeah, I think the custom just kind of expanded from what you experienced and what I know Rabbi Ketov and his book on the festivals talks about also just emptying crumbs from your pockets. But it reminds me of a wonderful story that uh, Blue Greenberg uh, wrote in her book, How to Run a Jewish Household, you know, 30 something years ago. And she said she always checked her husband's and children's suits from shul, because a lot of us, if we go to Kiddush, we bring a brownie, we, you know, we take a brownie, <laughs> you know, and and so we all accumulate crumbs in our yeah. clothes, whether it's Pesach or Rosh Hashanah. So, uh, so um, whenever my wife, Melissa, uh, is cleaning out something and finds something in an unusual place, we, we think of that Blue Greenberg story uh, to make sure you check your suit pockets. And certainly it's true for Rosh Hashanah as well. So Rabbi Kerbel, thank you so much for educating us this evening about Tashlich. It brought back fantastic memories of my Tashlich experiences in different places, such as my year in uh, Jerusalem at the Schechter Institutes, which didn't have water, obviously, in Jerusalem. So during the Aser Yimei Tshuva, I went with one of my classmates to the Tel Aviv beach, and it was just wonderful and 
Thank you for that. And I'll uh, keep in mind a lot of what you taught when our community does Tashlich this year. So yes, to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Rabbi Alana, I'll also share with you an essay I wrote on Tashlich, if you'd like to share that with everybody. Will do. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Shana Tova to everybody. Shana Tova. And now it's my pleasure to welcome all of our West Coast family and friends and who are joining us now that Shabbat is over there. Shavua Tov to you. And we will, those who have been here at the beginning, we heard Havdalah, but now we have many who are joining us from the West Coast. So we have Havdalah and Nigun and Nourishment with a group, Rabbis Adam Klickfeld, Rebecca Schatz. We're not ready yet. Okay. Almost. <laughs> Almost. And uh, Rabbi Cantor, Hillary Chorney, and Ziegler interns. So Rabbi Adam Klickfeld has served as senior rabbi of Temple Beth Am in Los Angeles since 2009, a graduate of Columbia with a degree in history and psychology, and a graduate of JTS's rabbinical school. Adam first served in Monroe, New York for nine years before moving to Los Angeles. His most recent work, in addition to shepherding a campus overhaul that saw the community dedicate an award-winning light-filled in the Round Sanctuary in 2019, has focused on interfaith relationship building, mostly with local Muslim communities and most recently with local black church communities, as well as integrating Jewish thought, practice and nomenclature into uh, meditation and mindfulness forms and practices that stem from the Eastern faith and cultural traditions. He's married to Javi, a couples therapist in private practice and the proud father to Noah, who many of us might know as a former USY international president, Aiden and Lev. He's an avid Yankee fan, an avid biker, and an avid and new dog owner. And many of us know him from school as just Clickfeld. So it's good to have him here this evening. Rabbi Cantor Hillary Chorney is the Cantor of Temple Beth Am in Los Angeles, California. She completed her cantorial investiture, rabbinical ordination, and a master's degree in sacred music at the Jewish Theological Seminary before joining the staff of Temple Beth Am in August, 2014. And I, she has a long bio here. I'm gonna read parts of it. For several years, she was the co-produced the Sacred Sounds Unbound Concert Series with Jewish music artists and the Cult of Filah Conference on Prayer Experience with, with the United Synagogue of Conservative Judaism. She's the newest officer of the Cantor's Assembly and she's an instructor for first year students at the Ziegler School of Rabbinic Studies. She's an avid writer and is currently enrolled in UCLA's extension program for a certificate in creative nonfiction writing. She serves on the advisory board of the Jewish Sacred Music Foundation, and she and her husband, Rabbi Daniel Chorney, met in Israel and continue and enjoy learning together with their two children, Ella and Yossi. So it's really a pleasure to have all of you here this evening. You can see their community right there and welcome, and it's all yours. Bore a peri agafe, 
Pastor Shavu, I tell people hear me on this? I want to thank you for raising the volume to three categories, three groups of people as we've gotten used to a digital religious experience throughout COVID. Uh, the most challenging version of that is a hybrid where you have real life human beings in three, in three dimensions in your presence and then you have a community that you want to feel connected to and you want them to feel connected to you on the screen and we have both our Beth Am community and family represented on one Zoom stream. And then those of you around the country and perhaps the world who are linking in through the Masorti movement, the conservative movements, and a worldwide Slichot experience from wherever you're joining us, we welcome you to our field outside Temple Beth Am in Los Angeles, California. The next hour is gonna be something that our team here has dubbed, created, Nigun and Nourishment. It's alliterative and alliteration is always a good thing. <laughs> and we created it in the midst, <laughs> we created it in the midst of the pandemic, really at the very beginning of it, when we sensed that people were obviously lacking contact with each other and feeling alone and desperate. And we really do believe in the power of a beautifully shared nigun, a tune without words, adding to it words and layers of harmony and wisdom from the tradition and some moments of mindfulness that allow us to center ourselves and at least for a second or two keep the chaos at bay. And so as we head into a very important season and the liturgy of the Slichot and the music of the Slichot is going to introduce us to that. We're going to spend this hour or so just fulfilling our, our needs as yearning human beings, needs that are often met sometimes by the simple articulation and the simple singing of a tune. Our theme tonight taken from Psalm 27 is Shifti Bebet Adonai. I sit in the house of God. We know enough about our religious life to know that a house of God is way more than a sanctuary, way more than a room, way more than a physical structure. Wherever we go, we're at least invited to imagine the Dalad Amot, the four cubits that we inhabit in that moment as a Beit Adonai, a house of God. And we're also invited to ask ourselves, who are we and who are we differently if we imagine that the place we are in is a Beit Hashem? Do we act differently, more lofty, more attuned with our values if we experience our reality as one that is perpetually in the house of God and the presence of God? And so we're delighted that you're all with us And if you're not in person, that does not mean you ought not sing. We won't hear you, but we'll sense you. And we can therefore spill out our harmonies across time zones and geographic borders, and we can join together as one. And so once more, we'll join together as one in this nigun that we began with.
It's a little dark, so I hope I can read that. Um, I wanted um, to share a few words um, about the days of old. Surprise, you didn't think that you would hear something on Elul about, not about the days of old. Um, <laughs> Rosh Hashanah symbolizes, arguably, the hope that the plea that we utter on Tisha B'Av, when we mourn the loss of Jerusalem, will be fulfilled. For truly, you have rejected us, bitterly raged against us. Take us back, O Lord, to yourself, and let us come back, renew our days of old. Those are the last lines in Eicha. In this week's Parsha, which we just opened tonight, Nitzavim, the Haftorah, the last of the seven Haftorot of Consolation, ends with, Bechol tzaratam tzarlo, umalach panav hoshiyam behavato ufrem lato, hu galam veyinatlam veyinasam kol yamei olam. In all their troubles, he was troubled, and the angel of his presence delivered them. In his love and pity, he himself redeemed them, raised them, and exalted them all the days of old. Despite these triumphant words in Isaiah 63, we still utter pleas on Rosh Hashanah to be taken back, to be inscribed in the book of life. But the mood is optimistic, almost joyful, definitely hopeful. The days of old are in reach. While the Hebrew in these two quotes is different, the one says yamei no kakedem and the other one is kol, kol, kol yamei olam, the English generally translates both instances as days of old. And no matter whether you feel very knowledgeable uh, of, of Judaism or really not that much, the term days of old will likely sound familiar. Either because you know it from the end of the weekly Torah service or from the high holidays or from Tisha B'Av or, and maybe more importantly, because it steers you up it resonates, even if you can't make immediate sense of it and explain what does it mean, renew the days of old. In fact, in our times, we may actually have an immediate association. Days of old, the days before the pandemic. The days when things seemed easier. Or in general, the good old days. Can God not bring us back to them? Can't they just return? For those of us who also celebrate the new Gregorian or secular year, we know it's a time marked with resolutions to change, to begin something new, to leave behind the old days. In the Jewish liturgy, we also want that, renew ourselves, become better versions of ourselves, reflect on uh, what we want to change. And yet, the sense which the days of old convey is more than a straight one-way street of no return and no looking back. Renewing in Judaism means valuing the old, continuing something that has been there before and has been forgotten, neglected, that can be a pact with God, with friends, with loved ones, with commitments. On one level, as indicated by the two quotes above, renewing the days of old can mean the return to Jerusalem, open to interpretation what that might mean to each of you. It can mean the return to God and to a way of life inspired by Torah, it can mean the return to feeling at peace with ourselves, whole, in a place where we want to be physically, emotionally, and religiously. It's the desire to go back in order to go forward. In US American imagery, the journey to the West is the one journey toward self-fulfillment. The journey to the new I, the better life, 
westward is the way to go, to leave behind old selves, the old country. Yet in Hebrew, one word for moving forward is kadima. And as the words of Israel's anthem say, ulefate mizrach kadima, ein lezion tzofia. As long as forward to the east, to Zion looks the eye, we have not lost our hope. In high holiday liturgy, looking forward is looking to the east, to Jerusalem, to the days of old, Kekedem, Kadima, it's the same route. Judaism is a cycle. We go through the Torah and then we start again. But it's never exactly the same. We turn it and we turn it and we turn it. We renew and preserve by giving it new life, backed up by the reassurance that before and after us, Jews around the world have found comfort and strength in doing the same, in not abandoning what was. The days of old are our days right now. The days of old are in the future. something different for every one of us. There's so much preparation time that's built into the rest of Jewish holidays. Achanat Shabbat. Even from the time maybe we're lucky to be campers, we're given extra time to go back to our bunks and prepare the space for Shabbat, every week. Pesach, we take so much time for Pesach. <laughs> Pesach preparation starts now. This week's special. The Tishrei, how do we prepare for Tishri. The trajectory tonight 
as we nourish ourselves is this sense of going from distance to intimacy with the divine. And we feel ourselves called into that place, into all the different homes that are described in Psalm 27, into Beit Adonai, into the Sukkah, into the tents. And we go all the way from there, if you'll feel us walking into the Sha'ar, into God's gates, into God's hands, through the music we're about to share with you, all of that. But somehow every year I feel unprepared. And maybe it's the Chazan in me, but I attribute it in part to the missing Mavarchim HaChodesh, to the missing blessing of the month, because we don't announce it, because we're not supposed to let the force in the universe that might bring some sort of might shake we're not supposed to bring that into our midst and so we don't announce the world, that's what we say But in fact, I think we're just never ready for Tishrei. And that's okay, because what I want to say before we herald in this opening of the gates, which, by the way, will stay open until Hoshana Rabbah, while we still do this psalm, before we say open up these gates to us. I want to say, Jewish time is such that it happens to us whether we like it or not. And we are invited to be actors in this system. We become partners with God who cannot possibly be hamotzi lechem min ha'aretz. Our brachot and other pieces of our Jewish tradition, our liturgy that remind us that Shabbat will happen whether we do it or not, and Tishrei will happen whether we are ready for it or not. But let's not just walk into Tishrei. Let's throw open the gates to Tishrei. Let's welcome Tishrei. Let's prepare ourselves for Tishrei. Let's be here. Let's walk into it present together. So. We'll sing together. Open up these gates.
invite you to close your eyes. And wherever you are, whether you're seated here with us on a field or in your home, intentionally orient yourself in whatever chair or couch or seat you're on so it's not an accidental sitting. It's a shivti bevet adonai. Sit as one should sit in the house of God. Allow the quiet that is created to penetrate you. There will still, still be sounds in the periphery. We cannot escape them. But we can make them less relevant to our experience. If you haven't already, place your feet flat on the floor in front of you to feel yet more grounded to the earth that houses us. And try to render your entire body like a weeping willow where your spine is the trunk doing all the work to hold you up. And everything else, a delightful hang and sag, releasing all the tension that we hold without even realizing it. If you can, adjust your breathing so it's in through your nose and out through your mouth. With the out breath being slightly longer than the in breath so that even breathing is an act of generosity to those around you and to the world itself. Giving a little more than you're taking. And using the tremendous powers of your mind, which can create worlds inside your own consciousness. I want you both to be very aware of where you are sitting in whatever space you're in. But also extract yourself from your actual locus and place yourself in front of a grand gate. Don't just think it. See yourself standing in front of it. Without even trying, your mind created some scene. You can see the size of the gate, the shape, the contours of the doors. You don't know why your mind created that image, but it must have had a reason. And as you see yourself, standing in front of this gate, who or what is beyond it? If you see yourself saying, Ptach lanushar, Ptach lishar, open this gate for me, to what? To whom? Is there a person waiting for you on the other side? An experience that will meet a certain need? Is it a different version of you that's only across that threshold? Is it the Holy One? Just watch yourself standing for a moment addressing whatever or whoever is beyond, imagining what it feels like to ask that a gate be opened. Sha'ar niftach, 
the gate is opened. Imagine yourself standing before a gate that was closed that is now opening in front of you and you step forward and you're alert and aware of many emotions that are present. Gratitude that you're there. Nervousness as to what will come next. Regret. Was it better on this side of the gate? Wonder. Awe. Curiosity. Exaltation. Ascent. Sweetness. Fear. Possibility. We are at the precipice of a season of gates and seeing the potential inside our very selves to be the forces that open it and claim what's on the other side. Perhaps with the spirit of God within us.
Into God's hands, I place my soul. What an image. We are taking our soul, our life force, and asking God to just take care of it for a while. We are entrusting this fragile, delicate existence of ours to God, directly in God's hand. In the morning, we thank God for returning it up to us during Moda'ani. We know that this return is never guaranteed. Each morning, there is gratitude that the ruler on high, living spirit of the universe, is giving each of us back our own soul, something so small in the scheme of the universe, but so big to us. And yet, despite this knowledge, we willingly entrust our soul to God, beado in God's hand. Hands are funny things. Well, we know that God most likely doesn't have a hand like we do with five fingers and attached to an arm. The image of a hand invokes something in particular. In the story of Yitziat Mitzrayim, the exodus from Egypt, we hear about God's strong hand and outstretched arm. We recount how each finger may have been a plague that struck the Egyptians. This hand comes with force, and while it ends well for us, it ultimately rains so much destruction in its path. But here, we clearly see a different side of God's hand. We might imagine an open palm into which we gently deposit our souls, like one would gently place a small bird or a steaming mug of coffee. And God lovingly takes it from us and holds on to it dearly to return it to us in the morning. In this moment, we have agency and we have choice, and we do the scary thing anyway. But Adonai Li Veloi Ra, God is with me and I do not fear. God is with us and we can choose not to fear. We can choose to have faith and know that God will keep us safe and guard our souls in this season and in our lives. I
before we do anything else, I want to make sure that we say Laila Tov and to the Rabbah, to Rabbi Alana Garber, and to all of our partners and friends at Global Masorti. One of the strangest things about hybridization is that we can't exactly see all of you, but we know you're there, you know we're here, and this idea of the connection that all of us are on the same calendar and all of us are doing salichot together is, uh, it's beautiful, it's connective, and we thank you for being nigun and nourishing chaverim and chaverot with us. So we're going to continue niguning and nourishing here, even as you move on with your evenings. We continue with ours. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. It was beautiful. And as we... Whoop, there we go. Um, hello, everyone. I've been sort of uh, behind the scenes here, but it's lovely to be able to um, continue this evening. And so I'm going to turn it over to our next presenters as I try to speak and do the spotlight. That's not going to work. So I'm just going to first introduce Rabbi Ari Sachs, who is a, um, a third generation conservative rabbi. And he is um, in his fifth year at the Huntington Jewish Center after having spent five years at Congregation Beth Mordechai in New Jersey. And this is pretty cool. He is known as the mall rabbi uh, for setting up office hours in a local mall. And he is going to be in dialogue tonight with Avital Morris, who is a PhD student in history at Yale. Her work focuses on the interaction of medieval Jews and Christians in legal contexts. She's an alumna of the University of Chicago, of Midrashat Ein Hanatziv, and Yeshivat Hadar, and she lives in Washington Heights. So I am going to um, invite Rabbi Sachs and um, Avital Morris to, uh, to join us, and I will spotlight you in just a moment. Thank you, Alana. Thank you so much for um, inviting us here tonight to be able to share some Torah with you. It was wonderful to hear the nigunim and the nourishment of um, Temple Beth Am in, in LA. It was just really lovely to hear. So I want to thank um, everyone out there for adding to our sleep coat night. And uh, hi, Avital, how are you? Um, Wanted to uh, let everyone kind of know a little bit about what um, the plan is that we have for tonight. So tonight's learning is actually not uh, slichot themed, but I think that actually the behind the scenes of the learning tonight uh, is very connected with the idea of beginning a new year. So one of the things as a busy pulpit rabbi that you often find that you lack is time to be able to learn. And um, as well that there are ideas, there's a thought in your mind that you want to be able to explore. So I reached out uh, to Mahon Adar, and particularly Rabbi Eli Confer, who I know spoke earlier today, and taught him a little bit about what my thoughts were and asked if there was anyone that he had in mind that could do some learning and pointed me to Avital as uh, someone who really loves to learn and, um, and thought that we'd be a good Herbruta partner. So, one of the things I think that as Avital and I started to learn together um, and the topic that we were wanting to both learn about was uh, biblical and rabbinic sources regarding intermarriage is that we both, anyone comes to any question with their own preconceived notions of what answer they may be looking for in whatever text. But it's a very different feeling to go and just look at the text as itself without trying to read in your own thoughts but rather to let the text speak to you and help inform your thoughts. And of course, we bring our own eyes and our own ears into whatever it is that we learn. You Ari, something happened and we lost your sound. Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me now or now? Yes. Okay. We're good. So, um, so the idea of the learning is to try to let the text speak to us. And I think the idea of having a Chavruta partner that we can really just 
talk the text together, just see where it takes us and to not know what the future holds, but to just let that learning take us. Uh, I think it's a beautiful message uh, for the upcoming year. Um, Avital, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on, on all that. Um, thank you, Rabbi Sachs, for um, that was so, uh, um, but yeah, I, um, I really enjoyed this. I think it's like a really good um, academy rabbinics um, working together um, partnership, and I'm really appreciating that. Um, and I think especially for, for this context, some of that learning um, sh should be should be interesting. Should we just start with, um, with yeah. are you going to um, share it? Or? Um, sure. So, that, so that's actually kind of what we were going to do for uh, tonight um, in terms of sort of exemplifying kind of the way in which we've been learning, but also to, um, and to allow the text to speak to us. Um, so what we're going to do tonight is we have two particular texts. The first text is uh, from Kings. And um, so obviously I think you're going to share that. Um, yeah, give me one second. Stop sure. It. So yeah. as Avital shares, so that we're going to do texts. The first text is one that we have learned already together. Uh, we spent a good amount of time unpacking it. And uh, we're just going to be uh, discussing it relatively briefly in terms of what our viewpoints are and what we're thinking of that this text is saying. But then we have an kind of like an unseen text in a way, uh, a text that we have read separately, but we have not actually learned together. And thinking that it may be a good way to continue the theme or at least one of the ideas that comes from this text on Kings. And so that's gonna be the majority of the time for the actual Chavruta is on that particular text. So we're gonna see how this goes and I hope that you'll enjoy. Uh, so we can see the text that's on the screen um, in front of everyone. And it has to do with King Solomon. King Solomon loved many foreign women along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian and Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the Israelites, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for they will surely incline your heart to follow their gods. Now, interestingly enough, um, especially uh, one of them, that seed, uh, that seed meat, that city, the Sidonian, is actually not written in the Torah as being one of the nations that uh, God forbade, and yet they're still mentioned here as one of those particular nations, which is interesting to think of. Are there, are all nations, are only certain nations considered to be forbidden versus others? And how does that play itself out in terms of understanding who one is allowed to marry versus who is not? So it continues to continue through. Among his wives were 700 princesses, 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not true to the Lord as God, as was the heart of his father, David. For Solomon followed Astarte, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not completely follow the Lord as his father had done. And Solomon built a high place, built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonite on the mountain east of Jerusalem. He did the same for all his foreign wives, who offered incest and sacrifice to their gods. So I think very clearly here, the text is basically is, is saying that by introducing the wives into his harem from, and from these foreign nations, that it would lead him astray. And in fact, actually, um, Avitav, you can go up a little bit. There is that word that we were looking at um, about, all right. So, so if you see, it's on verse two. Verse two, the Hebrew is, And the Hebrew word of davak, which means to cleave, that in thinking especially about um, the program we were just in, uh, the Nigun and Nourishment, that the idea of devekut, of cleaving to God, especially through song and through worship and through learning, that has the idea of coming close, of being able to really be connected. And this idea of the wives taking it away from him was that the wives would take away his sense of being cleaved and connected and loyal to God. 
And so, um, Avita, I'm wondering if uh, you anything to add, and if that's a fair assessment of what we talked about in our Harvard talk. Yeah, one thing I think is really interesting is just how many of them there are, right? It's not totally clear if, like, how things would have gone if he'd had one non-Jewish wife, if he'd had only bought Paro. It seems like part of the, like, part of what went wrong is that they all do different kinds of idolatry, and part of what went wrong is just that it's so much there's right, there's so many of these people. There's there's 300 princesses plus 700. Sorry, 700 princesses plus 300 concubines. Um, and right there's that there's a whole like class division of even like of the idolatrous wives going on. And I wonder right. like how we think that how you think that that sort of how do you think that that affects what happened to him? Right. It's 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 like this combination of both quantity and quality. It's you have so many, but then so many different kinds of gods. And so he's going to, to try to find ways to connect with his wives and to connect with their gods. And I wonder if that's also what's, what's a part of this. Yeah, right. um, he does the same for all of his, his wives. Like every time he has a wife who has a new, a different, a different god, um, he just, he builds that god. Um, uh, an altar. Um, I think it's also interesting to see like what's the sort of like the voice of the narrator who's like clearly telling us like all of right, there are like parts of Tanakh that have a kind of straight narration like here's what happened and let you the reader like infer what's good and what's bad um, and this is a narrative voice that really tells you like here's a list of bad things that he did. Um, all these gods are abominations um, and like what how like how do you feel like that sort of impacts how um, how you tell this story. Right, especially when it thinks about comparing him to David. For all of David's faults, Solomon is not near as good as David is. And yet it is Solomon who's able to build the temple. It is Solomon who um, really helped take the Israelite kingdom to the next level after David. Uh, and just thinking to, to consider um, those images of, of, of Solomon and David. Um, so one of the, you could take this text in many different ways. And what's great about Kavrut is that you can, really go off on it. What we wanted to, to offer though, is this idea of loyalty and this idea of clinging to something else, especially when you come close to it, because for Davak, the idea of even modern Hebrew's idea of glue is you kind of really bind two things together. So that led us to talk about this idea of idolatry as being um, in a way the clinging to idolatry, clinging to foreign wives is also clinging to their gods. And so in, to some degree, if you are trying, if you're told that you shouldn't be cleaving to the wives, is it because there's worry of cleaving to their gods as well? Meaning, is it not about the wives per se, but it's about the fact that the wives lead you to another place, to a place in which you are clinging actually to their gods. And so that also got us thinking about the question of, well, aren't there many other ways in which you could theoretically be cleaving to gods? And so one of the texts that we're gonna be focusing on along those lines, and, and, and particularly the question of, does it, if it looks like it's cleaving to a different God, does it mean that you're not any more loyal to your own God, um, is a story of Rabban um, Gamliel in a bathhouse. So Avital, if you wanna, should bring yeah. us to that, um, and then great. we'll. Okay. This is the text that we're going to. So, cover I want to like set the scene a little bit. Um, <laughs> this is the statue of um, Aphrodite that was um, from the bathhouse of Beit Shan, which some of you might have been there. Um, now it's a city in northern Israel. Um, at the time this was built, this was it was a city, a Roman city under Roman occupation, um, and. Um, it's probably similar to the, we're going to tell the story about the bathhouse in Akko, um, but this is probably sort of similar to how it would have looked. Big Aphrodite, you can see she's got like, she used to be brightly colored. You can see she's like still got a little bit of paint on her hair. Um, so you can sort of imagine this like in a bathhouse while you're in the pool, you can like look up at this Aphrodite and her baby Cupid and they're like really, really colorful and giant. Um, I just think it's like helpful to, to have an image um, to, so you can, you can put yourself in the setting. Okay, um, here's the story. This is from the Mishnah um, in, in Avodazara. Um, Proclos, son of Plosphus, asked Rabban Gamliel in Akko, who was bathing in the bathhouse of Aphrodite, and said to him, it says in your Torah, do not 
do, I'm sorry, do not any of what is meant to be destroyed stick in your hand. What are, why are you washing that in the bathhouse of Aphrodite? Okay, Rabbi Gamliel is under here, right under the bottom of where her feet are. Um, and Proclus ben Plosphos, um, which I think is sort of a like cartoonishly non-Jewish name. Plosphos is probably like philosopher. It's kind of like naming him like philosopher, like philosopher face. <laughs> Um, ask Rabbi Gamaliel. And that, I, I just want to see a person who's actually named like that because that's hysterical. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that like because I right. don't think it's like Proclus is a real name, but like Plosphos, I'm pretty sure is like like right. non-Jew make non-Jew face. Um, who is the and he's um so okay he has a good question for Rabbi Gamaliel. If the Torah says don't let any idle stuff stay in your hands, why are you in the bathhouse of Aphrodite? And Rabbi Gamaliel says to him, right. you don't answer questions in the bathhouse. Solid answer. Right. So, um, you know, it's, it's interesting because the, the name absolutely has that sense of, you know, philosopher, philosopher face kind of thing. But the fact that he asked that question mm -hmm. of, and by mm -hmm. the way, if you notice that sense of the yidbak here, that debek, that sort of clinging, mm -hmm. I think is so really thinking about the connection with the text that we read earlier. But that, that statement in Torah does not actually make, it, it did not make any sense. Meaning when I, when I was reading it, I said, how does that verse actually have anything to do with it? And until you get to Rashi, who actually says, or he brings a quote from, um, from the Midrash, that what that verse is saying in terms of um, do not any of what is meant to be destroyed stick in your hand. That stickiness mm -hmm. is referring to anything that is hana'a, right? Anything that is enjoyable when it comes to what you experience via these other gods. So it almost seems to mean here that, or at least the way I was thinking it, that Proclos actually was a Jew because he had to not only know Torah, he actually had to know Rashi. He had to know, or not Rashi in the sense, but in other words, he had to know the deeper meaning of it than just necessarily what it actually said there. At the same time, given what you said about the, about the naming, maybe there's also something else. Maybe it's like a Jew speaking for, in the name of somebody who's non-Jewish because they don't want to actually be seen as 